to Silent Hill 2. We still have quite a bit to go through and talk about and a lot of interesting things left, but this is definitely kind of like the last sort of gauntlet uh, leading up to the end of the game where everything up until this point, you know, it's a little bit more open and you're sort of wandering through the town. You're sort of picking up these clues here and there. But uh, just like last stream where we had picked up the letter and the wrench, we went back to Neely's bar and we started seeing a lot of these messages and things that are directed specifically to James. Um, just the same way that the, the messages and sort of the imagery and everything has become a lot more focused, the game becomes a lot more focused at this point. So rather than like walking through the town a whole lot more after this, we're going to be going through a lot of very narrow, um, sort of claustrophobic hallways into our last few areas <clears throat> before the end of the game. And yeah, the game just kind of takes on like a very different tone compared to the rest of it. And this part can, when you're playing the first time, feel a lot longer than it actually is. Um, places like the prison... I think when you're first playing through them, it's uh, kind of confusing and uh, can feel a lot more expansive than it actually is. But uh, if you know where you're going, the next few areas just kind of fly by. We start getting some really good background audio here. This is another one of those things I hate. Going back and kind of comparing to, like, the HD collection. Um, and we're starting off early with talking about things that I shouldn't be focusing on. But that sound, this iconic sound of the, like, boat foghorn that's uh, supposed to be playing throughout this area. Um, the HD collection instead mixes that sound effect up and has the sound effect of the footstep of a lying figure during this whole thing, instead of this sound. <clears throat> so it completely takes away, like, all of this atmosphere, all of the, uh, the weird tension of having this droning sort of boat fog horn going off every few seconds when you replace that with a footstep that you can barely hear. There's nothing useful written on them. There's nothing particularly special about this photograph. It's weird because, like, you can see there's Clearly stuff written there, and some things James will examine, like, closer. Oh, you guys are not hearing. My audio is messed up. There we go. Now you should be hearing the foghorn from that boat every few seconds. <laughs> The mooing. Yeah. It does sort of sound like a cow mooing in the distance. Yeah, the bot is dead. So none of the chat commands are going to work, unfortunately. It's fine. Photo is hanging here. Brookhaven Hospital, 1880. So we get a little bit of background on the Brookhaven Hospital, and through that, a little bit of history of the town. This hospital was built in response to a great plague that followed a wave of immigration to this area. It was originally little more than a shack, but it gradually grew and grew. So, based on the memorial that we saw um, in Rosewater Park, near the lake, uh, where it mentions people dying and, you know, there being, like, a memory to them in the lake. 
the uh, idea that those victims were possibly victims of this great plague uh, so that memorial could have been for people who died because of this plague it was originally a little more than a shack but it gradually grew and grew so at first there wasn't even like a proper hospital here it was only due to this plague that a hospital was originally even built in Silent Hill. And it started off just as a shack, but it gradually grew and grew. <laughs> Eventually to the point where if you take in if you take into account every single Silent Hill game, there's a lot of hospitals. There's a lot of uh there's a lot of hospitals around Silent Hill. Much more than just whoa, why did everything go black? Uh, the graphics like completely broke enhanced edition what happened that's weird the the overlay stuff's still there i can still examine stuff here i have a save file right here in the doorway that's weird Okay, there's our mooing again. We have our iconic foghorn going. Take two. We'll just pretend we didn't fall into a void and start all over. Can't examine the thing on that side of the door. Yeah, so he won't examine those, but he looks at the Brookhaven thing. So we get that history of Brookhaven Hospital. It started as a hospital in response to a plague. Photo of the director of the old Brookhaven Hospital. Looks like he was a famous person in town. Looks like, um... Hal Emmerich. From Metal Gear Solid. Just a similar kind of character profile. We don't really get too much information about, like, who specifically this is. Like, if there's a name for this specific director of the old Brookhaven Hospital. Like, is he the original director from the 18... What is it? 1880s? There's a photo of a deep, deep hole. What could this be? A lot of uh, very blatant foreshadowing. Like I said, this part of the game becomes a lot more focused into, you know, what's going on. Things start becoming a lot more direct and less subtle. Um, but at the same time, start becoming a lot more abstract. So this hole that we're seeing, this room... Um, we're going to be in that room and forced to jump down that hole in order to progress in just a moment. So not only do we have that painting, you know, showing something that we're kind of inevitably going to have to come across, have to face. The very first thing in the historical society is this, which very closely resembles where we're going to be fighting the final boss. So already we've got kind of these major things that are coming up in in the actual game being uh, foreshadowed very directly with literally just screenshots of those sections of the game on the wall as paintings. James even wonders to himself, what could this be? And now for the descent into insanity. In a lot of ways, that is very much, I think, what this is supposed to represent. James has been struggling with getting, you know, his idea of reality and his perception of 
the events of what happened leading up to him being here. Um, they, you know, those ideas and those thoughts, his narrative for what is real, um, has been at ends, you know, with sort of the ideas and things that he's being presented with. And now that the town is being a lot more direct about it, I kind of see this as like not only the town sort of drawing James in a lot more deeply, but James himself sort of losing more of that grip on reality on his way to breaking out of his delusion and coming to terms with reality. This entire staircase, by the way, is not like a looping gimmick or, you know, anything where they're only loading it in in front of you and uh, unloading the area behind you. This entire staircase from top to bottom is all rendered all at once. Um, if you check out my uh, my YouTube channel, there's a video called uh, Hacking Silent Hill with Necorun where Necorun takes a uh, camera and goes outside of the wall and just looks at everything from a uh, a very, very far, you know, side perspective where you can see the entire staircase from top to bottom. Like, they very easily could have made this just sort of a uh, a gimmick thing, and later games would even kind of try to replicate this. Silent Hill Downpour tries to do the exact same thing, but with a, a looping gimmick rather than everything being rendered in. Wonder if Remake will cut out this part? I don't know. Like, at this point, I, I really don't know what to expect from, from the remake. Based on what we've seen from the trailer, like, some things, it feels like they're trying to follow it pretty close to the original, but we can see a lot of other scenes that are very clearly changed, so it, it's hard to say. Especially since we don't have any new info yet. No new trailers or anything since last October. Um, some kind of document is lying here. September 11th, 1820. Prisoner number C221. I can't read the rest. What is this? So, that descent from the Silent Hill Historical Society, instead of being in a small historical society, you know, this relatively small building that's basically like a, a town museum, you know, town history, uh, all in one area, um, in like a museum format. This nonsensical, super long staircase just going further and further down, kind of representing this loss of sanity on James's part. Um, you have this reality breaking down effect. And now, instead of being in a building that is about the history of Silent Hill, you're literally in the history of Silent Hill. You are in a prison that doesn't exist anymore in the actual town. So it's really great how... Up to this point, everything has been, like, other world versions of relatively, like, recognizable areas and things. But now the game just goes, like, full abstract. You're going into places that shouldn't exist. You're not even sure, like, what time period you're in anymore. So they start playing with a lot of, like, really interesting concepts and, and ideas here. It's one of the reasons why I think people still enjoy playing this game and talking about this game as much as they do. More so than a lot of other uh horror games and series from this time because the abstract nature of so many elements in these Silent Hill games like there's so many different ways to kind of think about it and interpret it and 
all these elements, the fact that it's a prison tying in with, you know, James's sort of guilt complex, um, his desire for punishment. So the town sort of feeding off of that and being like, hey, you want to see what punishment was was really like, you know, back in the day here in Silent Hill? Well, here's just like a little taste. And you do have all of these sort of like historical things. It's still laid out almost in the format of the historical society with like paintings and descriptions on the wall. But now things are obviously like a lot darker, a lot grimmer, being kind of like the other world variant of the historical society. A painting is hanging here. Crimson and White Banquet for the Gods. In part two of this playthrough, uh, we went through Born from a Wish and we talked a lot about the rebirth ending and sort of all of the necessary elements for this ritual of rebirth that can be performed. We know that Ernest Baldwin, as a character in the Born from a Wish subscenario, was trying to complete this ritual. And you as a player essentially are trying to collect all of the necessary items to perform that ritual when you're doing the rebirth ending for New Game Plus playthroughs. This is just a regular New Game playthrough, so we won't see those items uh, on this particular playthrough, but you can see more reference to that here. Crimson and White Banquet for the Gods. So the Crimson Tome being a particular ritual book or set of writings that kind of describes and gives incantations and details for all of these cult rituals. And then the white banquet for the gods is most likely a reference to the white chrism, the white liquid uh, anointing oil that uh, you also collect for both the Born from a Wish sub-scenario and the rebirth ending. So... You can also, from that painting itself, if you can kind of... I wish this let you zoom in on things the way that you can in Silent Hill 3. But um, you can see one of the town executioners is depicted in this uh, particular painting. And they're basically wearing this long white robe or smock with a red hood on top that hangs almost in a very like pyramid like shape or cone like shape which is where that depiction of pyramid head is essentially supposed to come from is those uh the appearance of those old executioners from the town's past um in this one the victims that you see skewered very closely resemble the uh the lying figures that we've been encountering Photo is hanging here. Death by skewering. An execution at the prison. Death by skewering or strangling. To choose his death is the prisoner's last taste of freedom. So there's a lot of different things to interpret from both the image of the painting and the text that's written underneath. So first off, the death by skewering, we're going to see that paralleled with Pyramid Head uh, killing Maria. Maria is going to be reintroduced only to be killed again. And we'll see that death is by skewering, essentially. Um, death by strangling, um, you could almost equate that with smothering, the same way that James smothers uh, his wife Mary to death. To choose his death is the prisoner's last taste of freedom. So that text there kind of drives home the point that by James strangling Mary even if he was doing it through a sort of kindness he's trying to release her from her pain that she cannot ever possibly recover from uh, even if he was trying to do it with that in mind he's robbing her of her last taste of freedom she's not getting to choose on her terms how she dies. James is taking that away from her. So essentially this gives that idea that even in the 1800s in this horrible prison in Silent Hill uh, prisoners 
would have more choice in their own death than what Mary was allowed because of James. So you have, again, kind of these really heavy elements being parallel to what James has done and what, you know, he's having to come to terms with. And lastly, a photo hanging here, the Toluca Prison Camp. Built during the Civil War, later became Toluca Prison. So it was a prison camp during the Civil War first, and then later converted into like a full-on prison. And then as we learn uh, later on, the prison itself eventually gets shut down and demolished and built over where the prison once stood is now the historical society. So we're in a way kind of still in the same place, but out of out of reality, out of time, in in a completely sort of mishmashed reality of the past sort of stuck on to the present but also just kind of a nightmare world what was that who in the hell was that phantom cat punch thank you so much for the 50 bits very much appreciate it um so here we see the very same room very same camera angle even that was foreshadowed on the uh, painting before we descended the stairs of the historical society, depicting this very large hole in an otherwise empty room. You can try to look around and examine, but there is nothing else to interact with, and everything else dead ends to this spot here. The hole's dark and I can't see anything. Will you jump down? And as if it matters, you know, you're you're given the choice. Will you jump down? Yes or no. But ultimately, you're being forced to do something that essentially you you don't want to do. When that sort of thing is presented in the right way, it can make something really tense. Um, when it's presented in the wrong way, it feels just sort of like being railroaded into a particular decision. But here it's not so much about making a decision of whether or not you're going to jump into the hole, which is essentially succumbing to this madness. It's more like it's inevitable. It's got to happen. In order for anything to go forward, it has to happen. And you have to come to terms with it and agree to kind of go forward with it as a player. Would it have been interesting to have no as the first choice? Um, I don't know, because there is maybe some significance to that. You, you think about um, Silent Hill 4. I think Silent Hill 4 has it where your default option when picking anything up is no. Um, but it makes a little more sense in the context of Silent Hill 4 because of the limited inventory. So, I don't know. It kind of depends. It would be impossible to climb this. So, if you start just examining around the well... There's otherwise uh, no nothing notable, and you just have to keep wandering around and examining until you find a spot where the description changes. So, huh, this is different. Just this spot here feels different than the rest of the wall. I wonder if I could somehow break it. 
And in order to break this, you do need to switch to either the wooden plank, the steel pipe. If you're on New Game Plus and have the chainsaw, you can use that. Um, but you need to use some sort of melee weapon. Any guns will not be able to break this wall. And if you're playing the game normally, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're playing the game normally, you're pretty much always going to wind up with uh, some melee weapon, you know, to be able to break this. If you're speedrunning and using particular glitches to skip, like, the wooden plank in the very beginning, if you forget to pick up the steel pipe from out of the car, if you don't have the chainsaw in your inventory from the, the beginning, um, you can get to this point without any melee weapons and you're just soft-locked. You just can't progress the game. It'll never really happen under normal circumstances because you'll always, at the very least, kind of be forced to pick up the wooden plank, but if you manage to glitch through it, which... Theoretically, if you're just wandering around figuring out controls and mashing the quick save button, you could theoretically do that glitch on accident and skip the wooden plank and then run right past the Who? steel pipe what and then that? get soft locked Who in falling the into the well. Who that? Yeah, PC port, you uh, you don't need to be... If you're playing the, the default PC port, you don't need uh, New Game Plus for the chainsaw. If you're playing Enhanced Edition, they actually change that. They fix it and make it where it is uh, the same as it is on console. So New Game doesn't have the chainsaw on first playthrough on Enhanced Edition. Um, Count Wolf. Count Wolf, thank you so very, very much for the 50 bits. Very much appreciate it. All right, let's get out of this well. You can see we're already getting this imagery of sort of like the metal bars. More of these line figures. How are we on ammo? A hundred handgun bullets. We're going to shoot stuff. Also, what's up, DSB? Hope you're doing well. Hey, Kev Money. And yeah, Rachel, I did get stuck in that well. I have absolutely back in the day done uh, done some some runs where I just completely blanked on picking up a melee weapon. And I got to the well and I was just like, oh, right. I'm fucked. So kind of forces you, you know, a couple little side pathways here and there, but nothing that really leads off anywhere until you get to this point here. And this is another one of those moments where you walk in and at first glance, you're just sort of like, okay, you're, you're just in another weird room. There's been plenty of rooms where the floor is metal bars or chain link. Um, but if you start to kind of look at the surroundings and everything a little bit more, you realize the perspective. James is not standing on the floor here. He's standing on a gate. Like, his back is where the floor is. As if he was laying on the ground right now, looking up at the ceiling. And you can get the impression a little bit better. I'll uh, flip the screen like that so you can see the perspective a little bit better. So the neon light up at the top on the ceiling, the gate that's leading further down the hallway, the two doors on left and right side, which is a section of the, the prison that we're going to be running through very, very soon. Um, and James sort of walking into this room completely ignoring gravity um essentially out of the floor and trying to open a locked gate so really cool mind fuck room and i've seen a lot of people who 
sort of don't even realize get to this point of the game and not even realize kind of the perspective of this area. So just more of that like reality bending, everything sort of breaking down. Uh, similar to the ending of Silent Hill 1, when you get to the nowhere section of the game, uh, I kind of equate this to being Silent Hill 2's version of nowhere, where reality is really especially broken down and there's parts and pieces from different time periods and different places all kind of smashed together in one. So there's a door at the bottom. The door is locked. Now, when it comes to the speed run, again, there is uh, a way to essentially duplicate items and skip this puzzle entirely, but obviously we're going to be showing the puzzle. Um, so once you enter into this room, you'll notice that there is a key on the ground, and as soon as you pick up this key, the spiral writing key, your flashlight will automatically fade and turn off. Take a look at the spiral writing key. It's a key with a slim, three-inch long cylinder attached. The cylinder is engraved with spiral writing. And it says, "'Tis doubt which leadeth thee to purgatory." This is one of those elements where I, I like it in the context of what's going on right now. Like, we're caught in this strange, seemingly out-of-time, out-of-place existence while we're going through this this prison from this historical society to this prison to what we're going to see a, in a moment a labyrinth and all these other places and you can kind of see it as being this purgatory this place kind of trapped in between different layers of existence um which is what we're going to need to open that gate but the door has locked behind us and trying to turn on the flashlight you'll see it'll kind of flicker and start to light up but then doesn't actually turn on i press the switch but nothing happens so Earlier, while in Brookhaven Hospital, a lot of people I've seen do, I've seen a lot of people do blind playthroughs and stuff on Twitch. Uh, I love watching people experience the Silent Hill games for the first time, and so many people don't even realize that they have this battery. Um, you pick it up along with a key in Brookhaven Hospital, and most of the time, you're so focused on picking up that key and getting to go somewhere new in Brookhaven um, that you don't even realize you picked up this battery along with it. So you have this dry cell battery that you, get in the ho that you got in the hospital room. You've been hanging on to it this entire time, and you finally have a use for it. Just an ordinary dry cell battery. Looks like the same type of battery that the flashlight uses. It's the one and only time that you ever have to really worry about replacing the battery in your flashlight in this game. Um, let alone, like, any real Silent Hill game. None of them really do the whole your flashlight needs batteries gimmick. But, once you replace the light's battery, the flashlight works again, and the room is just absolutely crawling with insects. Look at all their synchronized moving textures. It might be pretty bare bones, but as somebody who like doesn't like spiders, a bunch of like spider-like insects in a small room with a locked door, like I would be very uncomfortable. I would not be happy. So there's only one way out. This door is still locked, and you can examine there is a keypad on the wall. 
And this is another one of those puzzles that I, I really, really like. I mentioned this, um, I think, during the Silent Hill 1 playthrough. And, uh, yeah, it was the uh, Midwitch puzzle in Silent Hill 1 before the final boss, where you just have to turn the valve handles and figure out how to rotate them in such a way so that you can walk through. Um, with this, there's no note or anything else. The only thing you have is the keypad and a randomized code. Every time you play the game, it's random and it's different. And three, well, sometimes two, but two or three of the buttons will be worn out more than the others. And you just have to, through trial and error, figure out what combination of those um, is the correct answer. So it's one of those puzzles. You just have to fuck around with it until you find something that works. And I love puzzles like that, where they're not overthought. It's not like a riddle and, you know, with all these little hints and notes and things you have to put together. Sometimes it's just a thing that you get to look at and fuck around with until you figure it out. So let's just try one, two, three. Damn. Three, two, one. It was three, two, one. Just like that. I mean, you just keep trying. <laughs> That's the whole puzzle. Um, but I like that, you know, it is randomized. Unless, of course, you manipulate the RNG. And then you can know what the answer is to that puzzle. Way all the way back from the apartments where you first look at the clock. The time on the clock. Um, but yeah. Or if you use the glitch to duplicate the spiral writing key, um, you basically duplicate it so that you have one in your inventory, but there's still one on the ground, so the door never locks behind you, and you just walk out of the room and use the duplicate key to open this door and just skip the puzzle. So we use the spiral writing key to open the door on the floor question mark not really floor but hallway gate it's pitch black beyond the door i can't tell how far the blackness stretches again illusion of choice you have to go down We're just descending further and further into madness. So much so that we run into somebody who is a little further along losing their mind than James is. Killing a person ain't no big deal. Just put the gun to their head, pow. You, you killed him? But, but, but it wasn't my fault. He, he made me do it. Calm down, Eddie. Tell me what happened. That guy, he, he had it coming. I didn't do anything. He just came after me. Besides, he was making fun of me with his eyes. Like that other one. Just for that, you killed him? What do you mean, just for that? Eddie, you can't just kill someone because of the way they looked at you. Oh, yeah? Why not? Till now, I always let people walk all over me. Just like that stupid dog. He had it coming, too. Eddie. <laughs> I was just joking, James. He was dead when I got here, honest. Anyway, I gotta run. You're going out there alone? Yeah. Eddie! So Eddie, Eddie basically straight up confesses to murder there. And then at the very last second, when James kind of calls him out for it, he's just kind of like, oh, I was just joking. Uh, anyway, gotta go. I love... Dave Shoffley's delivery on the lines here where you do get 
you do get the absolute sense that Eddie, like, you knew something was kind of wrong with him when you ran into him in the apartments. He kind of seems like a little bit more of a normal person, but still kind of off when you see him in the bowling alley. Uh, up to seeing him at this point with, like, a revolver in his hand and his the, the pre-rendered CG with the expression on his face and his eyes. And, uh, yeah, just Dave Shoffley's delivery those lines yeah that that yeah right as he's leaving but he uh he basically confesses to killing this person and you'll notice every pretty much every other corpse that we've seen up to this point has been a monster or james um it's recognizable as, you know, a dead creature or a dead James corpse that's been, like, mutilated. Um, except for one. When we first meet Eddie in the apartment, there are, is a pair of legs for something that looks human sticking out of the refrigerator. That looks different from any kind of creature, looks different from any of the James corpses, um, which all had, like, pants and boots on. These were, like, bare feet sticking out. So that corpse that we first see in the room right next to where Eddie's throwing up possibly his reaction to you know first killing or going so far we know that he's attacked and shot you know a person and that he shot and killed a dog but it might have been his first time experiencing what he thought it was killing a person I'm still personally on the fence if whether it's a person uh, a real person or a manifestation I lean more towards these being manifestations these are essentially what eddie is being forced to see instead of like monsters the way james sees them eddie sees people who are mocking him and pushing him to the point where he's doing this they're making fun of him with their eyes and he's losing his mind and shooting them um so i think these are manifestations from the town that are being sort of created to torment eddie and very distinctly Eddie's leaving behind corpses of bodies that are not James and are not, you know, creatures. These are sort of our only glimpses into what Eddie is sort of seeing in his version of Silent Hill. Since this game is very, very much about each character's individual perspective. So we start getting these little glimpses into sort of Eddie's version of Silent Hill. And things are a lot more crazy and we're seeing these uh, dead bodies of people who he thought were mocking him that he just shot and killed um <clears throat> it's a corpse the body is marked with bullet holes and we clearly saw eddie holding that revolver if you look at this painting on the opposite end of this room you can actually see that this room is what this painting is of it's all of the same tables and you can even see this painting itself at the other end of that hallway that we're looking down so the bottom right of this painting where the table is where the corpse is notice anything different about it not only is the placement of the body the same there's still a body there but it's not the body that Eddie left behind. That, you can see the green jacket. You can see the blue pants. So here we do have that James corpse lying dead in the same position as this. So again, we kind of have this foreshadowing going on to a potential outcome. James is building up to a confrontation with Eddie and he could potentially wind up just like this manifestation here if he lets Eddie get the best of him and surely that thought must be crossing James's mind whether he wants to consciously consider it or not he must realize the position that he's in so the town kind of picks up on that and we see it essentially painted out directly in front of us. This could be you. 
Directly under this, we also pick up the Tablet of the Gluttonous Pig. So this is the main, one of two main puzzles that we're essentially doing to get through the prison segment. So we have the Tablet of the Gluttonous Pig, a metal tablet with Gluttonous Pig drawn on one side, found, uh, found it in the dining room. And you can see it just depicts a human with like a pig-like head with some kind of meat on a stick or food on a stick. And we're going to be picking up these different tablets that represent each of our main characters. So clearly, after encountering Eddie, after, you know, being in this room that very heavily represents Eddie, we find the Tablet of the Gluttonous Pig and represents him. It's Mr. Boar from Rusty Lake. I I can see it. I can definitely see the resemblance. I still got to go through those games on my stream at some point. There are documents on the desk. They've got nothing to do with me, though. And gun bullets. This part, I I always felt like this section, this prison, was so much bigger when I first played this game and when I was younger. Because it's one of the most, like, viscerally scary parts of the game, in my opinion. I, I feel like the imagery, all of the audio, the heavy metal banging, the narrow corridors with these, like, distorted camera angles, not to mention... The game's kind of hitting you with a lot of this really heavy, you know, upside down rooms and rooms inside of paintings inside of rooms, like all this mind fuckery stuff all at once that this part always came off as just really terrifying and felt like it took forever to uh, go through and look at everything because you were just genuinely scared to continue exploring. Everything was... just, you know, really, really outstandingly um, jarring compared to the rest of the game. I love the way they set up a lot of these camera angles like you're kind of somebody else observing James. You're, you're seeing him on the other side of the prisoner visitation booth, you know where people would go to see people who were imprisoned, the same way that James could imagine himself going to prison and being worried about that if I don't, you know... The, think of all the things that would be going through his mind. He's trying to come to terms with having killed his wife. And even if he comes to terms with that, he's trying to come to terms with, you know, okay, well, he, whether or not he accepts his guilt for it, what happens? Does he turn himself into the police? Does he wind up going into prison? If he does go into prison, you know, he starts having thoughts of being behind bars. And sure enough, we manifest the Silent Hill prison from the 1800s. And we sort of get these very distinct angles of James in situations where he's sort of portrayed as a prisoner. So we're delving into kind of James's fears of repercussions potential repercussions for what he's done if he if he were to accept that you know the consequences of what he's done and uh, we find a lighter so this is one of the items for our second uh, puzzle that's going to be necessary for getting through the prison so first we're finding all of the tablets that we need and next, we're finding a bunch of items for a lot of people I, I can I know kind of complain about, I guess, the logistics, the reality of this puzzle, but I never thought this one was too bad. An 
knock on the door, but there's no answer. Did they change that room? Did they change that scare? I feel like I might have run into this before. <laughs> Three knocks. There it is. Knock on the door, but there's no answer. Yeah, that, uh, that audio jump scare. I feel like on, on the PlayStation 2 version, you, you pretty much always have it happen. Like, you just have to knock on the door once, and then you trigger it on your way out. Like, I feel like it, it's a lot more consistent on other versions of the game. This is why you stick to emulation. I mean, in most ways, this PC version with the Enhanced Edition mods is uh, still really, really nice. But yeah, everyone's got their own preference. Look at that. Somebody left their... I was going to say shit in the urinals. But it also it almost looks like intestines, like old rotted guts. Maybe also some shit. <laughs> looks like Walmart toilets. Nothing else here in the bathrooms. This is not a dream. What's happening to this place? Hey, boom button. Thank you so much for the raid. Very much appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. So everything here kind of dead ends. I just want to take a look around. At all these doors. It's kind of where you would be bringing prisoners through you have like a guard passes uh you have to pass things underneath here and then we have this there's a cover on the ground but i can't open it there's only a depression left where there was probably once a handle so at some point there was a handle but now it's just an opening in the door. To me, there's like a million things you could probably use to just pry this up. But of course, video game logic, we're going to need to collect a bunch of items to get our way through here. So right now we have the lighter. We're going to need a few other parts. Hey, Daedric Prince. Welcome. Welcome everybody coming over with Boom Button. Thank you again for the raid. Uh, for those of you who are new, I'm Nub Zombie. We're doing an in-depth story playthrough. Uh, I've been doing uh, super deep dive in-depth story playthroughs of the Silent Hill series uh, on Twitch since 2015. And we've been going through Silent Hill 2 this past week. Today we're going to be wrapping up Silent Hill 2, so... We're uh, a little over an hour in to today's stream, but we will, uh, we still have quite a bit more left to go. But yeah, welcome. Um, 
Oh, did I forget? I did forget the warden's room. As a little bit of a uh, side note, trivia, you actually revisit this uh, prison in the Silent Hill arcade game. There's a lot of stuff, uh, areas that they kind of recreate for the Silent Hill arcade game, and uh, this is one of them where you do get the option to uh, kind of navigate around and choose different pathways and um, it's accurate to uh, the layout the way it is here in Silent Hill 2. So here we've got like the warden's office. It's got a tea set, television, There's a lot of good supplies in here, ampule. The uh, TV with the blood on it reminds me a lot of the, it's, it's a slightly different TV, but with the placement of the blood on top, Kind of reminds me of the television set that we saw in the apartments in part one of the playthrough where uh, we see a corpse that very much resembles James um, in a chair that uh, has is dead in front of a TV with a large blood stain on it. So they're kind of calling back to some of that imagery, I think. Nothing interesting here. Box of cookie and butter cake. And there's this here on the desk, but you can also examine this bookcase for a diary, one of those very easy to miss notes during a playthrough. Uh, prisoners do not feel remorse. In fact, they do not feel themselves to be villains at all. Even the most uneducated brute will use what little words he knows to justify himself. And such trifling dreams they have, flourishing even in the darkness. Prisoners, too, are no exception. No matter how foul nor loathsome one's own life and existence may be, human nature is abiding. So that's from the warden's diary. That's, that's his perspective on it. That... Uh, Prisoners don't feel any remorse, uh, that most of them just deny, you know, being villains at all, having committed any crimes. And I mean, considering the way the prison system is, a lot of people probably are innocent, but the way that it's being phrased here, and you look at the way that this would apply towards James, and James feeling this guilt for, you know, what he's done, but not really coming to terms with it. So, even the most uneducated brute will use what little words he knows to justify himself, the same way that you could consider James thinking that he's, you know, killing Mary for her own good, and the way that he tries to explain, you know, what he's done, justify what he's done, as kind of releasing her from, from pain, but he is also doing it selfishly, because he wants his own life back. And such trifling dreams they have, flourishing even in the darkness. Prisoners, too, are no exception. So, yeah. Just very harsh, but at the same time, you can kind of see the, the warden's perspective on it and how that could apply towards James and his guilt complex as well. And then we have a magazine here. Uh, I've never seen it before. It's probably a locally published magazine. So it's something very specific, local to the area. Uh, Toluca Lake, the town's main tourist attraction. This clear, beautiful lake has another side as well. It may seem like just a typical ghost story that you might find in any number of old towns across the country, but in this case, the legend is true. On a fog-bound November day in 1918, the Little Baroness, a ship filled with tourists, failed to return to port. So I mentioned the Silent Hill arcade um, arcade game earlier. And believe it or not, that game does have a plot. Um, you can check out my YouTube channel 
and uh, or my playlist here on Twitch uh, VODs if uh, you want to watch a playthrough of the arcade game. But it focuses around the Little Baroness and its disappearance in 1918 and then the current day, quote unquote, descendants of people who were involved with that Little Baroness and uh, its disappearance. So that's entirely the plot of the arcade game. They kind of took this little note and expanded it into an entire game worth of plot. Uh, even if it's not great, it's still interesting. And I like that they kind of did that idea of drawing from things. Because the team that made the arcade game is completely different. Like, nobody from the original Team Silent worked on the arcade game. And the arcade game is still kind of fun for what it is. Uh, it's an on-rail shooter, so if you like House of the Dead, it's House of the Dead. But you go through Silent Hill areas and shoot Silent Hill monsters. It's not bad. And the story is all about the little Baroness, so it's kind of neat. You get a, more info on this little note by playing the arcade game. <clears throat> uh, a newspaper article from back then simply says it most likely sunk for some reason. Despite an extensive police search, not a single fragment of the ship nor any of the 14 bodies of passengers or crew has ever been recovered to this day. In 1939, an even stranger incident occurred. There are many pages torn out, so that incident kind of gets covered in the arcade game. Many corpses rest at the bottom of this lake. Their bony hands reach up towards the boats that pass overhead. Perhaps they reach for their comrades. So there's this idea that kind of like the lake itself is also haunted that there are these corpses in the lake um but yeah I, I love this little note information about the little baroness and especially once you go and play the uh, silent hill arcade game where all of that gets uh expanded upon it's not it's not a fantastic game but as i said it's entertaining as as an arcade game handgun bullets this is where we finally get the hunting rifle hunting rifle maximum capacity for shots takes a long time between shots but each shot is very powerful um i'm not big on the rifle in a lot of the silent hill games mostly because it takes a long time to actually ready it and aim with it and then get to a point where you can shoot um, compared to, you know, the shotgun or the uh, the handgun. Control's being weird. But I'm going to make myself use it. Situations like that when an enemy is right up front like directly in front of you if they are too close to you while you have the hunting rifle out you can actually miss if the barrel is clipping inside of the enemy because the the bullet will just essentially go through them and not actually hit them But yeah, I just don't like the length of time it takes to aim. And then you're locked in place. You can't move with it. Whereas shotgun, if as long as you're close enough to hit the spread for the most part on an enemy, it's going to do a lot of damage. And I mean, come on, look at this. Look at the mobility. How can you possibly deal with this? It's like the Terminator. Hey, Kayo. Yep, this will be on YouTube. All this will be archived. So we've got this area, which uh, is the showers. Got the Tablet of the Seductress. So here in the showers, 
We get the metal tablet with seductress drawn on one side, found in the shower room. There is our visual for what's engraved on the tablet. And for a long time, I used to think the tablet, and this is one of those good examples of different ways to interpret things. Um, <clears throat> so we're collecting all of these tablets, and they sort of parallel to our main characters. The first one, the gluttonous pig, parallels to Eddie. And initially, I used to feel like, okay, the seductress, that probably goes most in line with Maria. But over the years, like, kind of getting more along with the idea that Maria's a manifestation and not real, the main characters that everything else kind of focuses on, like the patients of Brookhaven being parallels to Eddie, Angela, and James, everything really kind of focuses around those three. So if you eliminate Maria from being a main character due to being a manifestation, then you have Angela instead being the depiction of the seductress, which due to the sexual abuse of her character implies that the way that and one of the things that is part of Angela's abuse is her mother gaslighting her and basically demeaning her, telling her that she deserves all of the physical and sexual abuse that she got from her father. And even though Angela is unwilling of that abuse, the mother made her out to be a seductress. In her mind, she wanted to blame it on her rather than, you know, and gaslight her rather than take responsibility for the person that she was with. <clears throat> Pardon me, my throat giving out already. But, um, yeah, it definitely gives it a much darker interpretation, but there's uh, a lot of different ways that you can kind of look at that. I feel like you can kind of look at it as being Maria, and maybe that is the ultimate intention. It's never been explicitly stated uh, in any supplemental information or interviews or anything like that specifically what those tablets represent but yeah lots of different ways to interpret things that uh, all make sense and n neither of those theories that I just threw out could could be correct Some great ambient sound when you kind of clear out these areas. It's always sort of like very distinct where certain areas, as you're going through the Silent Hill games, very specific areas, if you, uh, if you kill like everything in an area, sometimes it goes completely quiet. And sometimes you get creepy, droning, you know, ambient music or tones or sounds. Can't open it. So, for example, I need to kill the enemies here to show off some really cool details but we need to get rid of these uh, all these lying figures This would actually not be the worst time to use the rifle. When you're literally shooting a stationary target. So, all of the lying figures here are dead. And you can hear there's no more radio going off, even though the radio is still on. So, 
You can see that's on. And if you walk past this particular cell, James turns his head and looks towards something on the ceiling of this cell. And we hear that. We hear a, vo a, a voice coming through. And a lot of people speculate that that voice is saying ritual. Um, some people have other interpretations of it. To me, it does sound very, very much like ritual. I've heard the sound file. I've taken it and sped it up and pitch corrected it to the point where it just kind of sounds like a normal voice. And it does sound like someone with like kind of a slight Japanese accent saying the word ritual. But then again, fans have been wrong about this kind of thing in the past. It could even just be a stock sound similar to the whispers in the apartments. Um, don't really know for sure. Uh, but it's creepy just all the different things that you're getting um, to kind of interpret here. This whatever it is or whoever it is stomping around inside this prison cell not setting off the radio but clearly still there communicating in a very human like way and if you attack it it sounds very human like very different from monsters you can hear it like yell out One of the things that I've always meant to do, that I've always forgotten to check, one of these days I need to run this game with, there's a tool that basically tracks um, all of the things necessary for getting a 10 star ending. So it tracks how many items you've picked up, how much damage you've taken, um, and it tracks enemy kills because you have to kill a certain amount of enemies by fighting and by shooting. And... I don't know if I've ever checked if um, this enemy counts as, like, a monster kill. Or if it doesn't count at all towards that. Because, by all means, it doesn't set off the radio. It, it doesn't do a lot of the things that are typical of a monster. So I don't know if it counts towards that. Um, in an earlier part of this playthrough, earlier this week, I mentioned a there's a monument in Rosewater Park that we stopped and looked at, where there's a statue for somebody named Jennifer Carroll, a member of the cult who was persecuted by the Christians, according to the monument and the text that is engraved on it. Um, so you can assume that she'll be able to you know or that she was persecuted by the christians for being a member of the cult and being here you can kind of get the impression this cell this prison cell is very different from all the other cells that you come across here and it's full of a lot of if you're familiar with the cult in this game very similar symbols to not only the seal of Metatron, which we would remember from Silent Hill 1, but a kind of early precursor version of the Halo of the Sun from Silent Hill 3. This would be kind of refined into a slightly different design, but a very, very similar thing used for Silent Hill 3 and Silent Hill 4. So we start seeing sort of all of these cult rituals. You can see there's like symbols and uh, runes and things carved into the wall. We find the wax doll here, a doll carved from wax that was lying in the cell. It's just sort of a really weird little almost abstract shape for this wax doll. Hard to tell what it even really is. And if you examine a lot of the books and documents around here, books are scattered all over the bed and floor. On Sacrifice and the Art of Demon Summoning, Tome of the Seer, The Feast of the Succubi, 
fallen angels of mercy and favor. I guess I shouldn't worry about these too much. Books are scattered all over the bed and floor. Black magic from the abyss. Resurrection of the dead. So, of course, there's been a lot of themes so far that I've been pointing out um, that parallel, you know, resurrection of the dead and rebirth. Uh, a lot of symbolism towards that uh, through characters like Maria, imagery like butterflies and moths. Um, the Chronicle of Agrippa, Manuscript of the Iron Rings. Guess I shouldn't worry about these too much. So, on Sacrifice and the Art of Demon Summoning, Tome of the Seer. Yeah, all these different, obviously like cult material which uh, leads me to believe there's probably a connection between this and uh, Jennifer Carroll. That monument in Rosewater Park. She would have been persecuted by the Christians, imprisoned, and still, you know, trying to study and follow her, her occult faith, even while imprisoned. So we kind of see, like, the remnants of that. The history of that, just in that one little cell. All just for this. All, all we need is the wax doll. But there's so much interesting stuff to kind of infer from the details in that prison cell. There are blood-stained clothes here. It's always so hard to even see what kind of clothes these are. You can barely even tell that that's, like, supposed to be clothes. We have this large area. We'll come back to uh, this in a moment. We still need one more tablet. Hey, LC. Hope you're doing well. Here we've got another cell with some, uh, a few more cells with some interesting details and things inside of them. So this was the prison cell of somebody who liked art. And there are various paintings, drawings. 436 people at a recital. You can see it's just basic little stick figures, an audience. I notice a lot of them have, like, abstract shapes as heads. You can see basic little, like, up on a stage with instruments. Very crude, just kind of depictions of things. This is the one that is most significant, I think. So this is the hotel. The picture's titled Burning Man, and James doesn't even comment any further about it. He doesn't claim to recognize it or anything like that, but this is the Lakeview Hotel. So once we arrive at Lakeview and James will kind of comment, you know, this place looks exactly as it did three years ago because he still is having this delusion about how much time has passed um but once you kind of get to the point where james watches the tape and comes to sense comes to his senses comes to terms with what he's done and you see the hotel being sort of burned out and flooded and kind of take on a state that is probably closer to the state that it's actually in so now we've got some foreshadowing, not only to the hotel, but also some of its history that we do find out the hotel itself burned down uh, or at least caught fire. But yeah, 
right there at the bottom of the tech where the text burning man is that's the dock that james rose up to during that leads directly up to uh the main entrance of the hotel so we'll see all of this later this is probably just concept art honestly for uh for that area And woman in flight. Just another kind of crude drawing. Just a person, a woman, flying up above some city with one very particularly triangle-shaped building. Maybe it's Las Vegas? I don't know. <laughs> Superwoman. But yeah, a lot of things where, you know, you've got something that is very distinct and has a very definitive purpose, something that is instantly recognizable, the hotel, um, but then slightly more abstract things. The woman in flight, the, the people at the recital, there's a, you know, how could, how would you interpret those things? How would you think those are relevant to what's going on in the story, to to James or Angela or Eddie, are those possible memories for any of those characters? Um, you know, is the woman in flight Angela's thoughts and ideas of fleeing home, running away? Are the doing something in front of people and getting cheered on for it? The people at the recital would Eddie imagine himself being popular and rather than being made fun of, you know, performing music and people a crowd cheering him on is it supposed to be something more specific to this painter who even was the person in the cell you see what i mean there's like so many different ways you can look at it and try to tie it in and work it into the story but no definitive answers um as much as i like a lot of the things in this game that have very interesting definitive answers uh to strange mysterious things i i love how much of it does not have a clear answer and it's just sort of left open for people to interpret you know what they feel about it in this cell for example we've got a lot of religious iconography if you look very closely at like the pictures on the wall and things like that. You can see it's like Jesus on the cross. Uh, similar to stations of the cross. Common in churches that depict, you know, Jesus carrying the crucifix. And um, basically all of the key stages of the crucifixion of Jesus. So you can see all this Christian religious iconography throughout... Uh, this cell magazines here nothing of particular interest not quite as much to examine as in the other cells but this is also where we pick up the tablet of the oppressor so this is our third and final tablet that we needed to collect the tablet of the oppressor metal tablet with the oppressor drawn on one side found in the cell and you can see it depicts a male figure sort of attacking or overtaking possibly groping <laughs> um again the imagery is simple enough where you understand the overall meaning without uh, necessarily needing to be too detailed and explicit turtle thank you so much for the 25 months very much appreciate it welcome back thank you turtle Thank you, thank you. Um, but now we have the oppressor. Metal tablet with the oppressor drawn on one side found in the cell. So notice the, the tablet is specifically mentioning the oppressor, not the victim in this. So the tablet is representing the person doing the oppressing, the oppressor. And if you look at the hands sort of going for the head, going for the neck... The idea of strangulation being mentioned as, you know, a potential death for prisoners in the writing under the painting earlier before we got into the prison. And you think about James killing his wife, Mary, by smothering her, um, you know, with a pillow. This idea of smothering and strangulation 
being kind of the aspect of the oppressor or the executioner. So this is James. This is the tablet that is parallel to James as a character. He is the oppressor. So now we have something representing each of our main characters. The oppressor representing James, the gluttonous pig representing Eddie, and the seductress representing Angela, or possibly Maria. And you try to leave, and the iron bar door is tightly closed, and you can't force it open. And I love this moment, <clears throat> because it's so, like, throws you for a loop. There's nothing else to investigate. You feel like, I must have missed something, there must be a key here, there must be a way to open this. What did I miss? Is there something I can do with this? You know, can I use this here? Um, where the game sort of fools you into thinking that you're locked into this cell. But uh, you just have to examine the gate a few times and wait a second and then it will open. So it just locks you in there just enough for like a, a little bit of a scare just to kind of throw you off. I remember having, you know, that, that mini panic attack of like, did I just soft lock the game? Am I stuck in here? Was I supposed to have a key by this point that I don't have? Notice this time we've got the ghost stomping around in the cell here, very similar to the other one. You can see some more religious artwork in the cell that we can't see when we're in there by looking in from the outside also. Looks like a uh, bishop or somebody praying on the wall there. But in the cell right next to it, we have another stomping around ritual ghost thing. Uh, this time the radio is going off. So the previous one, the radio was not going off. This time it actually is. And again, you can hear those yells when you attack it are very distinct very different from like normal monster sounds so we've opened that up let's head back into that very large dark room Be sure to listen closely while you're in here. There it is. You can hear a sound that almost sounds like horses running around, like horse hooves hitting the dirt. There's something very creepy about this area in general. This is supposed to just sort of be like this it's this wide open area. It's supposed to be like the, the recreation yard. But it's all completely walled in. You can't even really see like... I mean, you can see the roof of it, but... It's just this huge empty area. Yeah, this is definitely another one of those moments with... You know, where if you have, like, headphones on or a really good sound system, it makes all the difference. The sound of the footsteps crunching on the dirt and the sound of the horse horse hooves hitting the dirt, kind of moving around in the, the space around you, even though there's nothing else in here with you. And the only thing that there is in this entire room is stocks with three... Nooses. There are three ropes hanging from the scaffold.
And on the front, we can see kind of like a crude depiction of a person being hung on one of these nooses with two pyramid head holding spears uh, standing along either side. So an idea based on everything else that we've been seeing, based on everything else we've been reading about the executioners of the past and with pyramid head that we've seen, we, we know that this is a depiction of the two executioners standing next to kind of like the one being killed, the, the prisoner who's being executed. And we're going to see this exact image recreated with two pyramid heads holding spears on either side of Maria being hung up and then executed. So we'll get to that a little bit later. Reading this, it shows, I give you blood to atone for the three sins. It's written on top of the engraving. Beneath the engraving are three square depressions. So this is where, this is where we're going to put our tablets. Um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't tell you like to place them in a specific order or anything like that. You just have to use uh, all three of them, which you can do by combining and uh, then using them there. Holy shit, Iceberg! Iceberg, thank you so much for a hundred dollars. Um, says, thanks for the quality content and calm. Nub, going on three years of lurking. We'll be seeing you around. Best wishes and getting that new PC together. Thank you so much, Iceberg. That is super, super kind of you. Very generous. That is insane insanely nice of you thank you so much i really appreciate that um yeah thank you thank you thank you i i cannot cannot stress enough like replacing the pc is so important for being able to continue doing what i do and the fact that people enjoy what i do and support me after all these years and still want to help me out and help me keep doing this means a lot to me so thank you so much iceberg seriously thank you thank you um, the remake will have a boss fight in this area. How do you think the remake will handle this? We might get a glimpse of how this is handled in the remake from the trailer already. We have a scene in the trailer with remake James holding a noose and it's raining. Um, it could potentially be this area changed into something new. Although the noose pulling animation comes from a puzzle that we're going to be doing later on after the labyrinth or as part of the labyrinth. Um, the innocent man puzzle. So it's hard to tell. Neither one of these situations has like rain. So that's already been changed for the remake. But yeah, there's there's no telling We're it's all speculation at this point. We'll see how it goes. Um, but using the three tablets here, the Tablet of the Oppressor, the Tablet of the Gluttonous Pig, and the Tablet of the Seductress, we get this iconic yelling bloody murder scream, which as far as I can tell is not any of our primary characters. It doesn't sound like Dave Shoffley, uh, it doesn't sound like Guy Sihi. I don't know if that's someone cast specifically for that. This could be another situation of a stock sound. But, uh... Blood to atone for the three sins. And the blood that we're giving are the three tablets representing our three characters, James, Angela, and Eddie. And once we hear the scream and start heading out from this area, there is now... A horseshoe. And this is everything that we needed for the puzzle to escape from the prison to get through that trapdoor in the floor. So let's head over there. Where did the horseshoe come from? That's a great question. It's one of those things that's just a mystery, like solving the puzzle made it spawn there and the whole time that we're hearing horses 
Uh, forget why do we hear horses in the yard anyway? So this again could just be personal interpretation, but um, this is like an old 1800s prison built during the Civil War and a common method of execution um, in those times and even well before those times was being drawn and quartered where you would be taken out to like a big area, usually outside, not like walled in like that, but a large open area where a prisoner or a person being executed would be tied to two or more horses and the horses would basically be sent to run in opposite directions effectively ripping apart the person the prisoner person being executed whatever uh in into multiple pieces so being drawn in court like like that was was a thing and yeah quartered specifically would involve four horses yeah four quarters each each arm and each leg to one horse it wouldn't always necessarily be that but that's that's the intonation that i get based on all the other methods of execution they've been talking about uh and just the time period of the prison but there's there's nothing that specifically goes through and says here's like the history of these horses or whatever that explains it in any more detail um so we have this trap door that we examined earlier there's a cover on the ground but i can't open it there's only a depression left where there was probably once a handle so what we're doing is essentially creating a new handle by using the lighter to melt down the wax doll and then stick the horseshoe into the wax after it's melted down in the socket where a handle used to be, let it dry and then use the horseshoe as a new handle. And I know a lot of people who've like complained about this one. It does feel a little bit sort of esoteric. This is very much just kind of like a point and click style puzzle for the time where you're just getting these three things to use together. And it's like, oh, that works? Yeah, exactly. It's it's adventure game logic, you know. <clears throat> it's like something that you would do in Escape from Monkey Island. Where it's like, yeah, sure, the wax would dry, and then you would have this horseshoe that works like a handle and lifts up this very heavy, clearly rusty door. It's, surely it's not just going to rip right out of this wax because, you know, it's just wax not the strongest material known to bond things together but you know i guess for the sake of this it works and you melt the wax and sure enough stick the horseshoe in and the adventure game logic lets us open up the trap uh trap door and it again gives us ultimately a an illusion of choice we have to jump down this hole to progress just the same way we had to jump down the other three holes that we hit jump down to get to this point on top of the super long staircase that we walked down to get to even that point <clears throat> we're just descending further and further and further into these sort of nonsensical well beyond reality sort of depths <clears throat> excuse me i'm gonna go and grab some tea i'll be right back Okay, that helps a bit. I've just got, like, cold tea on standby. I should have made some, some hot tea before I started, but...
anything to kind of give my throat a little bit of a break. But now we've gone through the trapdoor beneath the prison. This particular room, even though nothing happens in this room, this room was one of the ones that creeped me out the most as a kid, like playing this or an early teenager playing this for the first time. Just the idea of this morgue with all of these tubes just stacked with multiple dead bodies. You can see just feet and legs sticking out and up on top of each other. A horrible smell is coming from the hole. My god. In the hole. I didn't see that. James already trying to sort of cope with what he's seeing by telling himself he just didn't see it. The corpse smells nauseatingly of rotten flesh. Did that just move, or was it only my imagination? The fact that just this text, just the did that move text, shows up when I was very first playing this game made me second guess myself, thinking that sometimes these legs or these feet would actually move. And uh, this whole room and this kind of sequence gets basically completely one for one ripped off for uh, a game called Tormented Souls, where they do make the legs move and it makes it a much more comedic effect. Instead of it being weird and creepy and tense, even though nothing is essentially happening, the idea that it's, you know, disturbing to our main character and that you as a person are kind of expecting it, like I as a, as a kid was expecting them to move or something to crawl out. Um, <clears throat> when you actually have... Something like Tormented Souls, where the legs wiggle around, and it's it's just sort of like, ah, oh, the jiggling leg fever. And you just sort of, I don't know, for me anyway, it, it makes it a, a less scary, intense situation. Because the obvious thing happens, which winds up coming off as a lot more comedic. So again, it's one of those elements of utilizing jump scares, knowing when to do something like that, a sudden noise or a sudden something moving, knowing when to use it and when not to use it is something that I think is really important in horror. And you can see that restraint in a lot of places in Silent Hill and in a lot of the first four games where Team Silent sets up these very dark, you know, really awful visual things to sort of soak in and be terrorized by but at the same time you know they don't just throw things at you and be loud and jump scare you every chance they get the way a lot of games treat it um oqq thank you so much for the four dollars and twenty cents nub you are the best love what you do for the silent hill community i hope this brings you closer to the best PC you can get, Omar. Thank you so much, Omar. I really appreciate it. Really, really. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I really, yeah, everything going towards the new PC 100% helps me out immensely and lets me do what I do. So thank you so much. All right. This corpse into this hole. So James starts kind of piecing it together. You can see where there's like wheel marks on the ground where blood has been stuck to the wheels of these uh, gurneys, medical gurneys, while they dump bodies into just a big pit. All of this without having to tell you anything about this. They don't have to give you a memo. You don't have to like Silent Hill 4 even goes through the effort of making a big memo about a fucking corpse disposal shoot as being part of the the prison the chil the child prison that the cult has and you read all about it and learn all about it and how it works and how all the why it rotates floors and all this sort of stuff 
Silent Hill 2 doesn't do that. Like, you just have this imagery and some, you know, five words of text. This corpse into this hole. And it lets your mind paint the picture of what you're supposed to infer from this and what you're supposed to do next. There's a hole in the floor. I can't see the bottom. How far does this thing go? We descend even further. The ambient tones start getting a lot more dissonant and intense. Yeah, I love these cinematic camera angles as well. And we can see this is similar to the room with the hole in the center that we jumped in earlier. Um, the one that was foreshadowed at the very beginning of the historical society. But now, instead of just being a large hole in the middle of the floor, it's the entire room. The entire floor is just an even larger hole. Another hole. Do I really have to drop through it? Will you go down? So even James is questioning, am I doing the right thing here? Am I really supposed to just be dropping down hole after hole after hole? Like, yep, you have to descend. There's nowhere to go but down for now. Again, these really distinct angles. Omar, thank you so much for the 50. Holy shit. Sorry meant to put more. Yeah, yeah, you didn't mean to do 420. That's okay. <laughs> thank you so much for another $50 towards the new PC. That's super, super kind of you. Thank you so much, Omar. Very much appreciated. Thank you so much. <laughs> belly flop yeah i love james just on his stomach landed face first just belly flop directly onto the ground and sure enough he's he's fine we're not even taking damage the way that we did when pyramid had knocked james from the roof to the third floor um you get the impression that even more so, other than the fact that none of this makes any kind of logical sense for how it's laid out. But James not taking any damage from these, like, super long drops where you can't even see the bottom. Where he did take damage from a drop earlier, so... More of, a, more of a hint that a lot of what he's going through here is not playing by the, the rules of reality. And this, again, is all fully rendered. This is not like a looping uh, gimmick where everything is giving the illusion of moving down an elevator shaft. There actually is a full rendered top-to-bottom elevator shaft. And this has you move through it in real time. Thank you again for the uh, very generous tips towards the new PC, Omar. Really, really appreciate that. Can we play some elevator music? Sorry. It makes it complicated when I go to put this on YouTube. We need some license-free elevator music to have ready here. Is this the Randy Marsh moment? Eventually. We're not quite there. Alright, let's save it here. And we're essentially out of the prison and into uh, the area referred to as the Labyrinth. But we're pretty well stocked on a lot of our weapons, ammo, healing items can't get through here because of the wire stretched across the path. So everything we need to do, we need to go and find 
some wire cutters. One nice thing, if you do have enemies lined up, the rifle can hit multiple. It's pretty rare where you get them in a situation like that, where you can use it. Yo, a man has no name. Well, man with no name, uh, thank you so much for the $25 tip. Thank you, thank you. Very much appreciate that. Love your so awesome. Love the dulcet sound of your voice and your extensive Silent Hill knowledge. Thank you for the chillest streams. Oh, I missed. Man with no name, or a man has no name. Thank you so much for the 25. Very much appreciate that. Thank you for the kind words, and thank you for the tip. Helping me replace my dead computer. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So this is one of the few areas where we can see the mandarins again. And you can actually take the time and shoot them. They've got a death animation where they will uh, fall. Yep, they're referred to as mandarins in this game. The same enemy design gets slightly changed up with some new animations, and it becomes the closer in Silent Hill 3. Um, but yeah, in this game, their, their official name is Mandarins. I'm not sure why exactly, but they're closers in 3. And here's Pyramid Head. Like I said, we never see him again with his great knife, uh, only with the spear. And you can encounter him in a couple different places down here in the labyrinth. There's still no way to actively damage him. You can't kill him. You can't do anything to stop him. But he's down here. I love the camera. When you first walk into this room, you get this nice high angle looking through the vent, this chain link and this, you know, rusted fan, all this sort of what's become very iconic, you know, the, the rusty metal fan slowly spinning, the chain link stained with blood, all these sort of elements that kind of became synonymous with the other world depiction in Silent Hill. And you walk forward so that the camera changes and you get a view of what's actually in this room. These cages, bed frames to make that connection, that uh, symbolic connection I talked about during the last part of the playthrough with uh, the flesh lips and the final boss design. You see this cage design very, very frequently throughout the game. And all of it is supposed to represent Mary on her deathbed, being so ill that she is bedridden <clears throat> and unable to go anywhere or do anything else, just sort of withering away. And they represent her feeling being, you know, caged to that bed, being stuck in that bed through this cage imagery. And... Masahiro Ito very specifically wanted to convey that sort of idea of the bed frame and the cage kind of being a parallel to each other. So here we see cages directly on top of these bed frames, along with the bodies hanging upside down in the cages very much the same way the final boss is going to be presented. Mary or Maria being depicted in a cage uh, floating upside down. 
And this was all the background area of that portrait of Pyramid Head that we see in the first main room of the Historical Society. This is just the backdrop of that painting. Again, I love this ambient sound, that occasional sort of like whispery scraping noise. Great tension, good setup, creepy room, interesting symbolism, and we pick up the Great Knife, a massive weapon wielded by Pyramid Head, hard to use, but lethal. Just want to point out the item description does refer to him as Pyramid Head. There's been a weird resurgence of fans who seem to think that he can only be referred to as Red Pyramid Thing because there's a lot of official art and figures and things like that where he's referred to as Red Pyramid Thing, but he is called Pyramid Head right there in the actual game text. So, Massive weapon wielded by Pyramid Head. Hard to use, but lethal. And it is... Quite hard to use. It's, it makes James move incredibly slow. And it takes quite a long time to ready it and swing it. But if you do get a chance to hit anything with it, it does a shit ton of damage. So it, it's useful in a few situations. Great knife only meme runs. I've done that. That's on my YouTube channel. If you want to see me play through this entire game with nothing but the great knife from start to finish definitely done that before on hardest difficulty by the way so we've already done that pyramid head still over here causing trouble juke him just like Dead by Daylight. Do I have an archive? Uh, I do, here on Twitch and on YouTube. Although my... Oh, the bot is working again. Because, yeah, Yami just tried it. So, exclamation point YT in chat if you want to link to the YouTube. You want to go through all the videos there. Or uh, exclamation point VODs. if you want um, to watch them here on Twitch instead. There are a few things that are on YouTube that are not on Twitch, and a few things that are on Twitch that are not on YouTube, so... It's worth looking at both. But it's also, just be warned, I've been doing this since 2015. And a lot of my stuff is archived over the years, so L at last count, I think it's somewhere around 700 hours, 600 something, almost 700 hours of uh, Silent Hill videos. Because that command where it says 500 plus hours is... Uh, outdated. It's kind of old at this point. Were the sounds for this version uh, enhanced or is this all from the OG? So this takes all of those OG sounds and a lot of them are enhanced. Like the enhanced edition for the most part doesn't really add a whole lot of new things that were not there before. It just takes a lot of the original assets and either through just digital audio workstation going through and editing and cleaning up audio and then reinserting it into the game. Sometimes they use um, AI to enhance some of the images and audio, but yep, it's all original audio. Just made a little bit cleaner. Uh, this puzzle, so we're playing on normal action, normal riddle. This is an interesting one where every time you rotate this around, it rotates this room. And if you look around, you can see there's all these doorways. 
on each face of this cube. And of course the cube itself is made up of literal faces. These sort of like old Greek or Roman statue looking faces with different gems in their eyes. This feels the most like a Resident Evil puzzle. Out of every puzzle in the Silent Hill games, specifically in Silent Hill 2, most of them are pretty distinct and feel like iconic Silent Hill puzzles. This one to me always feel like felt like a Resident Evil puzzle where you're just rotating this and, you know, the room behind you is rotating. It's interesting. Don't get me wrong. I like this puzzle. And if you use a camera to zoom out, like kind of cam hack, you can see that as you rotate this, this entire room is rotating with you, like in real time. You can't see it because of this camera angle. But if you took the camera and looked directly behind you while you're rotating this around, you would see the room spinning around simultaneously. And there is a set solution if you're playing on easier normal riddle. So you can basically just always solve this the same way if you uh, if you play on that. If you play on hard or extra riddle, um, <clears throat> this is randomized. So you do have to rotate it around, come inside, look at all of the positioning of the doors on the faces from in here to figure out which way to rotate it uh, so that you get two doorways facing each other like this. And now we get one of the absolute best scenes in this game and one of the best performances by Monica Horgan as both Mary and Maria kind of simultaneously. You're alive! Maria, I thought that thing killed you. Are you hurt bad? Not at all, silly. Maria? That thing, it stabbed you. There was blood everywhere. Stabbed me? What do you mean? It chased us to the elevator, and, and then- James, what are you talking about? Just before. Don't you remember? James, honey, did something happen to you? After we got separated in that long hallway? Are you confusing me with someone else? <sighs> you were always so forgetful. Remember that time in the hotel? Maria? You said you took everything, but you forgot that videotape we made. I wonder if it's still there. How do you know about that? Aren't you Maria? I'm not your Mary. So, you're Maria? I am, if you want me to be. All I want from you is an answer. It doesn't matter who I am. I'm here for you, James. See? I'm real. Don't you want to touch me? I... don't know. Come and get me. I can't do anything through these bars. Okay. Stay right there. I'll be there soon. James... <laughs> James sounds almost hypnotized that he falls for that so completely. That last line. Okay, I'll be there soon. But yeah, there's so many great aspects to that scene. I love the the background sound 
that audio, this sort of like repeating, scraping, just constantly. It's like something scratching at your brain in the background, constantly happening. And then this whole interaction, Monica Horgan switching back and forth between, you know, Mary and Maria, how there's a very distinct voice to each of those characters and mannerisms in the way that she speaks and says certain words and says certain things. Uh, She does a great job distinguishing her voice between both of these characters and hearing them both kind of come out of the same person manifestation things mouth <clears throat> um she repeats a line that James said earlier where uh, he was like I wonder if it's still there talking about the tape in the hotel when uh, he first meets Maria and we hear Maria repeating these lines now and good friend of mine ufo techie who is also a, an absolute master when it comes to the silent hill games pointed out uh how how wonderful of a trope that is um that you do see it in a lot of other things but the way that it's portrayed here where you have this manifestation maria who is not a real person She's created from the town, created from James's desires, mixed with Mary's memories. You have this thing that is not a person mimicking a person, repeating back phrases and words that she's heard to try to convince James that she is not a manifestation and that she is a real person. So... It's a great scene. You get sort of the more creepy, monstery aspect of Maria when looking at that sequence where she's almost luring him um, and pretending, you know, going along with this, pretending to be this person, switching back and forth to intentionally confuse him where it is kind of like this shape-changing predator kind of playing with its prey. It's very creepy. Love it. Um, Even just the depiction of the scene itself, sort of the idea, again, James having this desire for punishment. If you look at the way that things are laid out, you can't really tell who is in prison here. Like, there's prison bars, but who is supposed to be the one that's in a cell? Is it James, like, in this side with these random little stools and and nothing else? You know, there's a nonsensical whole staircase leading into this area. Whereas on her side, there's a bed, there's an IV drip stand, there's a chair, there's a door. So it's got, like, a normal way to get in and out of that room. It's almost like a combination of a hospital room. And a jail cell. And again, you sort of think about how Mary must have felt being trapped in her hospital room, being trapped in her bed, feeling like a prisoner to her illness, you know. So seeing those sort of elements, the IV drip stand and the kind of hospital style bed and the same presence of like the prison bars sort of. James thinking about being in prison for why, you know, for what he did, for killing his wife, repercussions for what he's done. And Mary, her memories of being imprisoned in a hospital bed, you know, withering away due to her il- her illness. So both of those thoughts and ideas sort of manifesting into these these sequences, representing both characters. It's really cool. A lot to take away from it. And now we get what... The whole thing that we actually needed. The wire cutters. Tool for cutting wires or electric cables. It's exactly what we need to get through the door that uh, we were trying to go through once we uh, first got to this area. Yeah, 
And once the wires are cut, we've got even more watery, horrible labyrinth to go through. And again, this section of the game, when I was younger, always felt so much more big and so much more confusing. And once you kind of know where to go, you realize how short a lot of these last sequences in the game are. But they're still very effective. They're still very powerful for being kind of confusing. One of those early ideas of um, utilizing creepy liminal spaces to kind of inside horror. Trying to actually use the rifle, since I always talk shit about the rifle. Oh, am I actually out? Never mind, we're out. A lot of these camera angles are set up specifically to kind of, if you're not paying attention, if at this point you might have turned off your radio. Don't know why you would ever do that, but some people do. I know some people who say that the game is less scary if you kind of turn down a lot of the scarier sound effects and the radio sounds. It's the only way they'll play these games. See, a lot of these wrong passages just lead to, like, big dead ends. Which is why I don't really go out of my way too much to, uh, show everywhere in the labyrinth. I just kind of make my way through it. Because it's really just meant to make you hit some dead ends and backtrack until you, uh, learn your way through it. Yeah, Filthy Bear, you read a game fact guide that says turn the music off so that you can hear the radio better. I, f I think I've read that same guide. Uh, I've got a lot of the old guides uh, saved and archived on, like, old-ass hard drives I don't even have here. Stuff that's, like, sitting in a box in Texas somewhere, but... I feel like I remember reading a Game Facts guide where, yeah, they suggest adjusting the audio and turning off the music and stuff so that you can always hear the radio, know exactly when there's enemies nearby. Here's another, uh, another spot where you can encounter Pyramid Head. Just down here, wandering around with his spear. And just like before, nothing you can do to hurt him, slow him down, stop him, do anything with him. Alright, now we're going to be getting into some heavy stuff. There's already been a lot of heavy stuff in this game. It's obviously a, a really psychologically heavy game dealing with some very upsetting topics. But uh, if you have any trigger issues or problems with sexual assault anything like that this is your warning this gets pretty intense so now we're going to get some more details on Angela we've kind of gotten up to this point our encounters with Angela have given us a slight idea of her character the abuse that she's undergone the way that she's very untrusting around specifically men and people like James um, her sort of child going back and forth between childlike ways of talking 
and um, all everything about her demeanor, everything about her character screams, you know, abuse victim. So now with this newspaper and this next bit of info, we get a lot more of the history of what brought Angela here to this point. So there's a newspaper on the ground. It's stained with something that looks like blood and is partially illegible. And this is another one of those instances where some of the text is going to be blocked out. Um, this is not a dream. What's happening to this but place? In the game files, you can look at the uh, the full text. There's no way to unlock it normally through the game. Aaron, thank you so much for the raid. Thank you, Aaron. Much appreciated. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're streaming well. Welcome, everyone. We're uh, in the midst of a Silent Hill 2 in-depth story playthrough, nearing the end, but we've still got a couple hours of stuff to uh, to go through and do and talk about. Um, what I'm doing right now is pulling up my notes for the full newspaper, the blood-soaked newspaper. So here you can see it's typically blocked off. There's no way to unblock this normally through any means in the game, but if you go through and look at the game files, you can see the full text. And it reads, The body of a man later identified as Thomas Orozco, uh, lumberjack, age 39, was discovered in the middle of his room lying face up. So this is Thomas Orozco, Angela Orozco's father. The probable cause of death was multiple stab wounds to the front of the neck and the left side of the torso by a sharp-edged weapon. The estimated time of death was somewhere between 11 p.m. and 12.30 midnight. So the knife that Angela was holding with the blood on it is the murder weapon that she stabbed her father, Thomas Orozco, who was attempting to rape her, sexually assault her, and she fought him off using this knife, stabbed him in the front of the neck, the left side of the torso, and uh, killed him sometime between 11 p.m. and 12.30 midnight. Due to signs of struggle in the room, and the, lo and the lack of a murder weapon, so the murder weapon was not found on scene because Angela still had it with her. We have it now. Police are considering this a homicide and have opened a murder investigation. Furthermore, given the fact that the cash in the room was untouched and Mr. Orozco had a history of drunkenness and violence, the police suspect the motive was not robbery, but some sort of crime of passion. So he has a known history of drunkenness and violence. So this has been a problem for a long time. He's he's somebody who probably was getting drunk, beating his wife, beating his kids. When it came to Angela especially, though, you know, he was also sexually assaulting her. Her mother, Angela's mother, you know, probably had to adapt to this, was terrified of Thomas and, you know, was gaslighting Angela into thinking that she deserved all of this abuse. But eventually, Angela had enough. She had planned on running away. She uh, she got basically attempted to run away shortly after graduating. If you go off of some of the supplementary material and what was in some of the game manuals. But uh, Angela is described as having run away shortly after graduation. Uh, Thomas Orozco went and found Angela after she had run away basically kidnapped her, dragged her this back is home, not a dream. attempted What's to assault her. To this place? She fought him off with the knife, stabbed him to death, and then ran away and wound up in Silent Hill, where we find her in the beginning of the game. Uh, Pythonicus, thank you so much for the raid. Very much appreciated. Hope you had a good stream. Hope you're having a good night. Welcome, welcome. Um... But yeah, so there is the newspaper clipping and a lot of disturbing information about Angela's past. 
And now we're also going to have this. Uh, newspapers are scattered all over the walls and floor. There seems to be nothing of interest. But this one has today's date. That's kind of strange. So I think with the implication there is that he doesn't specify a date. He just says today's date. Now, James is not the most reliable narrator for what today's date is anyway, because the last three years are all part of his delusion. Like, it doesn't really line up. But I think the idea that we're supposed to be getting is just that the article written about Angela and written about Thomas Orozco's death is from today, meaning that Angela killed him recently. I, I don't know that it's meant to be thought of too intently to try to figure out what the date is or how relevant it would be or how reliably James would know what it is. It's more so, I think, just to convey the idea to the player that Angela killed her father recently. It wasn't like something that she did a long time ago. And now we're going to come across Angela and the uh, boss fight, the boss known as the Abstract Daddy. And this is one of the best examples where explaining how perception of reality works and how manifestations work in Silent Hill 2. Keep in mind, this is also specific to Silent Hill 2, like the way the town's power and all these sorts of things kind of work differently in their own way from game to game. But specifically with Silent Hill 2, we're, uh, we're going to experience sort of multiple people's perception of things being different all in the same space where Angela is going to be reacting to the to this thing as though it is just her father she is just seeing her father the man Thomas Orozco whereas us seeing the world through James's eyes we're not seeing that we're seeing the abstract daddy what Thomas Orozco represents So that's why we hear Angela react like that. But we clearly don't see her father. We see the abstract daddy. Which, it's design alone. This is just tons of visual symbolism all over. From the creature design to the room itself. Um, the abstract daddy represents, again, a bed frame. A lot of the cages and bed frame sort of uh, design and symbolism coming through, showing how people feel trapped in a particular situation. For Mary, it's trapped in her bed due to her illness. For Angela, it's trapped in an abusive household. Um, so this bed frame with two humanoid figures, a much larger human figure on top seemingly pinning down a smaller uh, more feminine humanoid figure underneath and they're sort of stuck to each other in between these like sheets made of skin old rotted skin so you can see again sort of the where the feet come down where the larger figure on top is and you can see the outline and the area of where the smaller figure underneath is it even has like a very uh, vaginal looking slit that it attempts to attack you with on the underside of the bed everything kind of designed around sort of the visual symbolism of sexual abuse the room itself being very fl like flesh like even your footsteps and things are very like wet and squishy the uh, pistons going in and out of the walls are very distinctly metallic to imply an even stronger meaning behind them being foreign objects. They're not natural. They're not fleshy like the rest of the room. 
just everything about this is so fucking horrible. And Angela is just sitting there, basically traumatized, while we run around. And uh, let's let's kill Thomas Orozco. Let's let's murder this piece of shit. Angela, relax. Don't order me around! I'm not trying to order you. So what do you want then? Oh, I see. You're trying to be nice to me, right? I know what you're up to. It's always the same. You're only after one thing. No, that's not true at all. You don't have to lie. Go ahead and say it. Or you could just force me. Beat me up like he always did. Ugh. You ought to care about yourself anyway. You disgusting pig. Angela. Don't touch me. You make me sick. You said your wife Mary was dead, right? Yes, she was ill. Liar! I know about you. You didn't want her around anymore. You probably found someone else. <sighs> That's ridiculous. I never. So we've seen this behavior in James before, where he sort of starts to come to a realization of a thought and then trails off before completing it, where that thought would be kind of a breakthrough into, you know, him getting past his his delusions. So <clears throat> James, you know, her saying, Angela yelling at him saying, you know, you probably found somebody else. James being like, that's ridiculous. I never. But he he doesn't finish that thought. He just kind of lets it trail off there. And a lot of that is due to Maria up to this point. He sort of is thinking of Maria as being someone new, someone other than Mary. And considering that is a possibility for an ending for you to get, they don't want to definitively have James just say, you know, I would never cheat on her. I would never move on and find somebody else. No, it that thought doesn't fully form in his mind because he's not willing to face it. He's not willing to accept that truth just yet. But yeah. Super disturbing scene. Uh, and boss design. Everything that it implies about Angela, especially knowing, you know, that Angela is supposed to be uh, a girl in her late teens. Um, you know, having suffered this kind of abuse since childhood. Just... Really awful, really, really awful, but it's necessary to sort of give the the context to her character because that's sort of what this game overall, as far as themes, is kind of exploring. You've got these three characters, James, Angela, and Eddie, and they're all murderers. You know, Eddie, we only know 
up to a certain point. We know he shot somebody, but we don't know if they died. We know that he he shot and most likely killed a dog. But again, <clears throat> Eddie's kind of unreliable. We don't know the extent of what he's done. But I would assume there's probably more to it than that, where he's on the same level, if not worse, than what James and Angela have done. But we have this idea of these characters who are, are all murderers, but you need to understand what they've all gone through and give them context as people that led up to them doing what they did. You know, James killed his wife and you could look at that and say, no matter what, no matter what the situation, killing is wrong. James should not have killed his wife. But then you learn more about how it was impacting her quality of life and her illness and how bad it, you know, became um, and how it was affecting her attitude and how it was affecting James's life. And you start sort of piecing together why James would try to justify what he does in his mind. And it's up to you as a player to think, OK, is that a good enough reason to justify what you've done? You know, same thing for Angela. She defended herself against her abusive father. Um, and he wound up being stabbed to death. Is she justified in that? You know, now that you read that newspaper, now that you see that room, now that you get all the implications of the type of abuse that she's endured and for how long, you know, and what Thomas, <clears throat> what Thomas Roscoe was like. And it makes you sympathize with her and it makes you think, yeah, she's probably justified in that. But the game makes you think about it. That's the whole point. It makes you consider these things. These three characters who are similar in some regards, but very distinctly different when it comes to the context of their lives. Like what brought them up to these particular points in their lives. So we have another puzzle here. Six bodies hanging with uh, particular crimes written across the faces. And in here, six corresponding nooses in the same position. And we have a poem to read. Dead men, dead men, swinging in a tree. How many dead men do you see? Tongue turned blue and face gone gray. Watch them as they twist and sway. The first one killed the butcher man, then cooked him in the frying pan, served him to his hungry guests, and gave them seconds on request. The next one, with his smile and sweets, stole poor children off the streets. To men who dressed unsavory, he sold them into slavery. Breaking into a home at night, the thief, he had a nasty fright, filled his foolish head with ale, woke in the morn in the county jail. The artist, with his daunting skill, tried his hand at painting bills, but caught in rain he was undone when the ink he'd use did start to run. With promises of great return, taking gold he did not earn, bundled it up out of sight, quietly slipped off into the night. Three houses into ashes burned. The sheriff, with no place to turn, did spy a stranger to his town, locked him up, and beat him down. Mega Radman, thank you for the prime resub and the kind words. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate the support. So, out of everything that we read here in the poem, um, it describes criminals performing particular acts of crime so the person who is a murderer is described as killing the person who is you know swindling and making fake dollar bills and things like that are all you know <clears throat> they're all uh described as doing their particular crime this one this is the only one where a person is described that is not guilty of the crime being described. So, three houses into ashes burned. It doesn't describe somebody burning those houses down, just that the sheriff with no place to turn did spy a stranger to his town, 
locked him up and beat him down. So he assumed it was the stranger, locked him up. So this is our innocent man. The whole whole point of the puzzle is to figure out which is the innocent man. Dead men, dead men, swinging in a tree. How many dead men do you see? Six feet long and six men wide. Round their necks, the noose be tied. What type of pizza was Eddie eating? You joke, but I went on a whole, like, 30-minute rant about Eddie's pizza. Go watch part two. That was in uh, part two of this overall story playthrough when we went to the bowling alley. We go on a whole thing talking about Eddie's pizza. But now we have our puzzle. So we're looking for the innocent man. This is how we know that we're looking for the innocent man. Only the sinless one can help you here. Mistakenly pull on a criminal's rope and your reward will be returned to you in a shape most wondrously strange. They make that sound so much cooler than it actually is. So if you pull the wrong rope, it'll just spawn some lying figure monsters in the hallway in between the two noose rooms. <clears throat> not that monstrously strange. It's not nearly as cool as they make it sound. But we know who the innocent person is. It's the arsonist. So now, just examining. This is the swindler. This is the thief. This is the arson. So the arsonist is the uh, noose that we need to pull in the other room. Great puzzle. And uh, if you really don't want to deal with it, you can brute force it. The penalty for guessing wrong is not terrible. This is the scene that I think we see recreated for the Silent Hill 2 remake trailer, but it's raining for some reason. Just to make it more dramatic, I guess. But yeah, we, we kind of see that scene recreated. James pulling that noose down almost, and it's framed the cinematography of it where the camera shot gives us the feeling of James pulling it down and sort of considering it for himself. The the thought crossing his mind of, you know, himself, you know, hanging himself using this noose. Because <clears throat> that idea, that sense of suicide and that sense of wanting to be punished for killing Mary is still in his mind. It's still in his subconscious. It's getting closer and closer to the surface you know it's he's not through his delusion yet but more and more that is becoming part of his his main conscious you know thought of himself and awareness of how he feels about you know killing mary so we see it manifested in that imagery you know having to pull this noose down for himself and we pick up for solving that puzzle the key of the persecuted key left by prisoner who was wrongly executed and that is used here i can't turn the handle unless i remove the handcuffs so it's just handcuff keys the key of the persecuted is specifically handcuffs So we've gone through all that, that entire labyrinth sequence, everything ever since we saw Maria on the other side of those prison bars, uh, everything has been leading up to this. We're finally at what you can see is room 208, and room 208 is where Maria was. That's the, the other side of those prison bars, so we finally got to where she is. Maria? Maria? Maria, no! What happened to you? Why? 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 
So just like before, Maria is killed in front of Mary, or in front of James, to remind him of Mary. And even here, listen to what he says. Mary, not Maria. The first time when she died in front of him in the in the bottom of Brookhaven, running for the elevator, he's yelling, Maria! Now, after everything else he's been through, and he's closer to getting through his delusion, he recognizes that this is reminding him of Mary, so he just says, Mary. <clears throat> There's nothing else for me in this room. There's nothing more that I can do here. I don't want to, but I'll have to just leave her here like this. So no matter what, James kind of has to come to terms with it. It's like I have to move on past this. But the town essentially forcing James to witness Maria, you know, dead right in front of him, completely forcing him to, uh, to remember that he's the one responsible for killing Mary. And to try to make him come to terms with it. And right back here, we can see there are three gravestones. There's a lot of gravestones. I'm going to go through these three first, because these are the three most important. So there's a name inscribed on the tombstone, Eddie Dombrowski. So the everything that's been happening up to this point, the patients that are reflected in Brookhaven, uh, that all are parallels to these characters, the prison with the tablets that were all parallels to these characters, now we're seeing graves for each of these characters. So there's Eddie, a name inscribed on the tombstone, Angela Orozco. This also gives you Angela's last name so that if you didn't already know what her last name was, this is where you draw that connection <clears throat> to the Thomas Orozco newspaper that you read before the Abstract Daddy boss fight. And lastly, James Sunderland our own grave and you can see it's just another bottomless pit very similar to all the other ones that James has been dropping through up to this point but let's also take a look at the rest of these this is an area known as the catacombs the name of the tombstone is too scratched up to read an epitaph is inscribed here. This felon drank one last bottle of ale before he was executed and laid here to his eternal rest. So, felon. You know, we get the idea that this is a graveyard for people who were felons, people who were prisoners. Not good people. The name on the tombstone is too scratched up to read. There's a name inscribed on the tombstone. Miriam K. Traitor. This is one of those elements of the game where there's a lot of speculation behind who this Miriam K. is, why they are a traitor, what significance this has on the game. There's a whole page of notes that I have on my dead computer that I can't access about a Hawaiian princess who was known as Miriam... I'm not even going to attempt to say the last name, but it starts with a K, who was thought of as being a traitor because she, like, didn't marry this Japanese military person where it would have become, you know, like a, a joint effort between Hawaii and Japan. Something like that, where she was considered a traitor for, like, declining to marry this person. There's all this stuff, and and that may be true, that may be why it's there, but I've never found any element 
directly from like a dev or anything like that explaining that that's what it was or why this is here, what relevance it has to everything else. So your guess is as good as mine on Miriam K. I've done a good amount of research on it, but there's no definitive answer to what that name on that tombstone means. And there's a name inscribed on the tombstone, Walter Sullivan. So now we have another person who we read a note about earlier uh, who killed, you know, two twins, Billy and Miriam Locaine, and uh, is described as being, you know, a murderer, just the same way as these other things describe felons and traitors, as well as Eddie, Angela, and James for being murderers. So you're just kind of getting this creepy, nonsensical graveyard, like none of this, none of these people should be here. This is, we dropped through a dozen, you know, half a dozen holes and gone down elevators and staircases. We're in a completely nonsensical place. Like this is not reality. So you shouldn't really take any of this too literally. I think it's just symbolic of here is a graveyard of horrible criminals and included in this graveyard are you and the characters that you've been interacting with. That's the main takeaway. <clears throat> hey, Nub. Uh, we go into James's grave, but Eddie's down here, so do you have an interpretation as to why Eddie's here? Um, no, again, I don't think the gravestones and the things themselves should be taken that literally, like, at that face value. We go into James's grave because this is, from James's perspective, his story. You know, this is this is his journey through what's going on. Even though it's encountering other people like Eddie. It's not meant to be literally, you know, Eddie is is here in James's grave. Or maybe it is. Maybe that is how it's meant to be interpreted, because I, I can't say for sure my thoughts on it are 100%, 100 correct either. Maybe it's intended that it's foreshadowing to Eddie being one of the things in James's way that could potentially stop him or kill him. He could be the one to put James in his grave. What if those three graves are connected? They are very close to each other, so that would make sense. And we recognize that these three characters are kind of parallels to each other in certain ways. But uh, here we get a great, great scene. Again, another wonderful performance by Dave Shoffley for Eddie just kind of descending into complete madness and some really great camera work. Pay attention to all of these individual camera cuts and different camera shots while Eddie is talking and sort of going on his crazy rant. Um, yeah, there's so much the the background sound the ambient tones and the music um everything building up here with eddie losing his mind is is really great eddie what are you doing what does it look like he always busted my balls Fat, disgusting piece of shit. You make me sick. Fat ass, you're nothing but a waste of skin. You're so ugly, even your mama don't love you. Well, maybe he was right. Maybe I am nothing but a fat, disgusting piece of shit. But you know what? It doesn't matter if you're smart, dumb, ugly, pretty. It's all the same once you're dead! And the corpse can't laugh. From now on, if anyone makes fun of me, I'll kill him! Just like that.
Eddie, have you gone nuts? I knew it. You too. You're just like him, James. Hey, I didn't mean anything. Don't bother. I understand. You've been laughing at me all along, haven't you? Ever since we first met. I'll kill you, James! Eddie gets a free shot. James kind of reacts like he gets hit in the shoulder, but you don't take any damage. Kind of kind of like you did earlier when Pyramid Head knocks you off the roof. Like, it doesn't automatically drop some health off of you. Maybe he's just a really bad shot, even up close. Kind of like Kaufman <clears throat> in Silent Hill 1. And there's a lot of different ways you can kind of approach this fight, but easy, straightforward, as long as you've got ammo and health, you can just kind of tank shots. I would say shotgun is better than the rifle. Rifle, sometimes your shot gets interrupted because it's a bit slower. Um, the great knife is not a terrible choice if you know how to set it up. But the problem with the great knife is if you mess up the timing, then uh, Eddie can just keep hitting you or shooting you and interrupting all of your swings. So before we move on to the actual Eddie fight, I want to point out perceptions of reality. So the same way with Angela seeing the abstract daddy as her father, Thomas Orozco, in the same room where James is seeing the abstract daddy, people are perceiving reality in different ways. Up until this part of the game, us as a player, like we've only been seeing really what James sees. Now at this part of the game, everything is kind of becoming merged. We're starting to see Angela and Eddie's nightmares mixing in with James's nightmares. All the things from all three of their minds, all of their subconscious um, feelings about everything are manifesting together. So now we have this sort of cold, misty, foggy environment much like we've been seeing around the town. Um, but because of the meat locker and kind of the meat hooks, the appearance of this in the next room especially, you kind of get the implication that Eddie sees things as being very cold. Uh, at least that's kind of my interpretation of it. This all feels very much kind of like a, a cold meat locker type you know, environment. And uh, I, I sort of assume this is meant to be taken like the way that we're seeing Eddie's version of Silent Hill right before Eddie's gone. The same way we see the burning stairs uh, with Angela before she's gone. <clears throat> and she describes it as being, you know, for her, it's always like this. So presumably for Eddie, it's always like this. It's full of people who are mocking him, making fun of him, and uh, especially cold. So, up until now, James has been coming across corpses, and to James, those corpses resemble him. And they resemble him because they're part of his subconscious desire for punishment. He wants to be dead. Part of him subconsciously wants to be dead. He wants to die for having killed Mary and the guilt over doing that. Um, and he doesn't come to terms with it, so that subconscious element of his mind is manifested into these corpses that resemble him that we've been seeing all over the town all the way through this playthrough um but now all these corpses that eddie's been leaving behind that are very distinctly not james now we're seeing corpses that eddie has left behind that are james we're seeing the the combination of what James's mind is manifesting and what Eddie's mind is manifesting. We're seeing sort of their realities clashing. The same way that we'll see that with Angela a little bit later in the hotel. That's why I 
ran away after I killed the dog. Ran away like a scared little girl. Yeah, I killed that dog. It was fun. It tried to chew its own guts out. Finally died all curled up in a ball. Then he came after me. I shot him too, right in the leg. He cried more than the dog. <laughs> gonna have a hard time playing football on what's left of that knee. You think it's okay to kill people? You need help, Eddie. Don't get a holy on me, James. This town called you too. You and me are the same. We're not like other people. Don't you know that? Let's party! Let's party, Eddie. So I'm gonna step to the right. Next to this uh, hanging bit of meat. All this hanging meat that kind of resembles Eddie. The shape of it. It's even got cloth like stitched onto the bottom that sort of looks like Eddie's shorts. I'm gonna switch to the knife. Oh, if we position it right... He shouldn't be able to punch me. Clearly, I'm not positioned right. Oh. Here we go. He's just standing there. He's taking it. Oh, God. We messed this all up. We messed this all up. We're going to just chase him around with a piece of wood now. We'll, we'll get a longer look at the uh, the boss fight. Because we never really spend very much time on Eddie's boss fight. Usually we speedrun this. But... We have this whole big freezer area. <laughs> Bop! All this meat. Eddie-shaped meat. Eddie? There he goes. Eddie? I... I killed a... a human being. A human being. A human being. So James sees a dead body, and the first thing on his mind... Mary. Mary. Did you really die three years ago? So again, that's all his mind is going to. He's, he's starting to question his delusion directly. Did you really die three years ago? He knows now. He's starting to, to understand that what he thought has been real ever since he got to the town might not be the reality of what has happened and it only took watching maria die and killing eddie and going through everything up to this point to to finally start to really understand and realize that we'll whack the meat one more time out of respect before we leave A big wooden branch over there. Just kind of poking out of the fog. So now we're finally outside again. After all of that, we went into the historical society. That was like three hours ago. Walked into the historical society, walked down some stairs, fell down half a dozen holes, took an elevator even further down, like just kept going down and down and down and down, further and further to the point where we find Eddie, murder him, walk outside through these doors, and you can see like there's the fence and stuff up there. That's where we just were. That's right outside the historical society. We're like maybe 30 feet away. 
after doing all that. Although you can see remnants of the, the prison sort of still exist. Warning, keep off. And uh, this sign right here. Warning, persons procuring or concealing escape of prisoners are subject to prosecution. So anyone caught trying to help prisoners escape out onto Toluca Lake, you're going to jail. And as we start heading down the docks, you can see a point of light way off in the distance there in the fog. And that's our destination. That's where we're headed. Over to the other side of the lake, to the Lakeview Hotel. We're going to row our, row our way over there in this boat. But uh, before we start rowing, I want to point something out. Something that's kind of silly with this game. So this is James' normal movement speed. When you're when you're running, here's like walking speed and running speed. If you have the great knife equipped, this is your movement speed. There is no run speed, and this is your walk speed. Considerably slower, right? Well, the funny thing is. Whenever you get into the boat to row across Lake Toluca, your movement speed is tied to whatever your walking movement speed is. So, like, how fast you move in the boat depends on how fast you move normally, which is almost always the same. Except when you have the Great Knife equipped. So if you have the Great Knife equipped and then get into the boat, the game still counts it as equipped, and you row the boat slower. It literally takes you longer to get to the other side of the lake because you're moving at a reduced rate because the Great Knife is equipped, even though you're in a boat. So we're gonna take a little bit longer rowing. Is that a bug or is it symbolic? I think it's just a quirk of how the game is programmed. Which ending am I going for? I'm not going for a very like specific ending. Usually the nature of in-depth playthroughs will cause me to get the leave ending. Usually, but not always. The way this game calculates endings, there's a lot of things that can affect it that are not always entirely in my control when I'm just uh, taking my time and examining things, letting monsters hit me, that kind of thing. But this is all you have to do for this segment. Just point the boat towards the light and start rowing towards it. There are a few other places that you can row to while you're out on the lake. You can technically kind of row over to where the uh, the Rebirth Island, but the game doesn't actually let you get there. Like, you can't actually see it or interact with it or anything like that. It's technically there. But yeah, you you really are just rowing all the way across to this point of light. Um, interesting note about this on console. So if you're playing on the original PlayStation 2 and you're playing on hard mode, you actually have to rotate your analog sticks to move the oars. Like, the left and right analog stick moves each oar independently. So you have to do, like, a rowing motion. Playing on PC, you just have to hold forward. It doesn't matter what difficulty you're on, you just hold forward and that's the direction you go in. But on console, you actually rotate the sticks to move the oars. But only on hard mode. This 
Is there a point for that? Is there a monster in the lake that eats you if you take too long? No. You get you get ranked. Like, there's a scoring event on the results screen that tells you how long you took in the boat. But it doesn't really affect much. There's the hotel. This place hasn't changed at all in three years. So that's... 100% just James's delusion. You know, the hotel by this point, it's caught on fire, it's been flooded, uh, it's in terrible, terrible condition. But James is still so heavy, so strong under his delusion that uh, to him the hotel looks like it did three years ago. We're also going to learn that timeline is not exactly correct. Got a little mermaid music box. There's a fountain in the shape of a bird. No water is coming out of it right now. Can we admire the fountain? Sure, why not? Look at the beautiful fountain. The little mermaid fountain. You get a better shot of it when uh, picking up the thing, but... This whole area, like, you don't get to explore a lot of the outside part of the hotel, but looks nice. The parts that you can see. Another fountain over here. Fountain in the shape of a bird. No water's coming out of it now. Tale of birds without a voice. A tale of birds on my bullets so we get our map of the Lakeview Hotel we're finally here it's kind of like the f absolute last area of the game and it shows the third floor, room 312, waiting for you. What's this? Room 312, that's the room Mary and I stayed in. Mary, are you there? Or maybe... I got a hotel map for guests. Why are the music boxes about princesses? Um, that's a good question. Like, in Silent Hill 1, it's kind of a thing because of Alessa. Like, everything's being manifested from Alessa's subconscious. And Alessa's a little girl. She likes fairy tales. She likes, you know, stories and uh, things like Wizard of Oz and Alice in Wonderland become puzzles because that's what's on her mind. You know, it becomes something created by the town. Here, we're seeing things mostly from James's subconscious, but... There's also things from Angela and Eddie and, well, not Eddie anymore, but Angela and potentially even Mary or maybe Laura to some degree, since Laura's also here. But up until this point, she hasn't had any effect on the town and she mostly just sees it empty. So there's there's no real telling, like there's no guaranteed definitive answer what's the status of Mary's letter good point so we've had this letter from Mary since the beginning of the game that's definitely Mary's name in her own handwriting on the front of the envelope but now after killing Eddie and examining this there's nothing written on the stationery. so that letter what James has convinced himself that this entire time was his purpose for being here. He got this letter from Mary, so she must be alive. Uh, waiting in their special place, it was never real. The writing is gone. And little by little over the next, you know, few sections of the game, this all disappears. The writing goes first, then the paper itself, then the envelope will all disappear.
An empty plate, a knife, and a fork. That's all. Nothing much of interest. And sitting on the plate was the fish key. Key with a fish-shaped keychain on top of the restaurant table. One of those just kind of weird visual things. It's a, it looks like a fish laying on a plate, but it's just a keychain. Piano jump scare. Laura jump scare. Did I scare you? Yeah, you did. Did she scare you, chat? You're here to find Mary, aren't you, James? Well, have you? No. Is that why you're here, too? She's here, isn't she? If you know where she is, tell me. I'm tired of walking. So there's Laura's motivation and how she's been getting I around. Wish I knew. But she said it in her letter. What letter? Want to read it? So this is a real letter. But don't tell Rachel. As okay. opposed to the one that James has had. Who's Rachel. She was our nurse. I took it from her locker. There we have Rachel, who is Laura and Mary's nurse while they were in the hospital together. So this actual letter from Mary, as opposed to the fake one James has had this whole time, gives us a lot of insight. And Laura gives us a lot of insight into kind of our, our timeline of events now. My dearest Laura, I'm leaving this letter with Rachel to give to you after I'm gone. So Mary wrote this with the intention of after she's died, leave this with the nurse, you know, give it to Laura. So this is one of the last things that was written while she was alive. I'm far away now in a quiet, beautiful place. So of course she's talking about the afterlife. She's talking about heaven. Laura reading this note is interpreting this as heaven or excuse me, as silent Hill instead of heaven. Um, to Mary, you know, she's trying to explain this in, in like a nice way that a child might understand it, but it kind of does the opposite, where Laura's sort of too innocent to really understand what Mary is talking about. So that's why she came to Silent Hill looking for her. She thinks that her saying that she's far away now in a quiet, beautiful place, um, she's thinking that Mary is talking about Silent Hill, this quiet, beautiful place that she went to with James back before she got sick. Please forgive me for not saying goodbye before I left. Uh, she knew that she probably wouldn't have any control over when she passes and being able to talk to Laura went before she did. Be well, Laura. Don't be too hard on the sisters. The way she says that makes me think that Laura is in some sort of a church run uh, orphanage since no sort of parents are mentioned and Mary mentions adoption here. So usually that would be like sisters of the church, nuns, uh, that run this possible orphanage. Don't be too hard on the sisters and Laura about James. I know you hate him because you think he isn't nice to me, but please give him a chance. So this is Laura, Laura's perspective based on the things that Mary says about James and based on seeing, you know, how often or not often James would come and visit and how Mary would treat James when he did come and visit. So Laura hated James. But Mary tries to vouch for him, says please give him a chance. It's true he may be a little surly sometimes and he doesn't laugh much, but underneath he's really a sweet person. Laura, I love you like my very own daughter, just to show how close they are. If things had worked out differently, I was hoping to adopt you. So she literally was willing, if she hadn't been, you know, stuck in the hospital, if she hadn't been ill, um, she would have, you know, been willing to adopt Laura. That's, that's how much she cared for her. Happy eighth birthday, Laura. So specifically was writing this knowing that she probably would not live long enough to make it to Laura's upcoming eighth birthday. <clears throat> right? Your friend forever, Mary. Laura, how 
old are you? So James asks. I turned eight last week. She says eight last week. So Mary couldn't have died three years ago. Could could she really be here? See, he starts getting through the delusion, beautiful place but then he just about? comes up with a different delusion that she is here. Me and Mary talked a lot about Silent Hill. She even showed me all her pictures. She really wanted to come back. That's why I'm here. Maybe you'll get it if you see the other letter. The one, Mary. Huh? I must have dropped it. Laura. I gotta find it. Laura! So the other letter that Laura's talking about there is the letter that we get at the end of the game. And essentially, those are the only two real letters from Mary that we ever get throughout the game. Both of those were written by Mary right before she left the hospital. So she was in the hospital and she was about to be sent home for her last few days, you know, where she was going to be around her loved ones, around James, before she passed away. So... Mary, during her last days in the hospital, writes a letter for James and a letter for Laura, intending to leave them with Rachel, the nurse, to give to Laura and James after she passed away. But, of course, Laura, being who she is, sneaks into the locker, steals the letters, you know, early. So Laura reads it. And Mary disappears from the hospital, going home to spend her last days with James. James, of course, winds up killing Mary, suffocating her with a pillow and killing her once she's home with him. And Laura interprets this letter about her being in a far, beautiful, far away, beautiful place, knowing that her final days were coming. She didn't explicitly want to tell Laura that she was dead, that she was dying. And Laura, being an innocent little kid, interpreted that as Silent Hill. Like, Mary said this was a quiet, beautiful place. She was always showing her pictures, telling her about the great time that she had here with James. So, reading that letter, after stealing it out of Rachel's locker, Laura came to the town on her own. She came here looking for Mary, thinking that this is where she had gone to when she wasn't in in her room in the hospital. So she came here on her own. James, on the other hand, Mary went home from the hospital to spend her last days with James. James took this as the opportunity to, quote unquote, end her suffering. He uses a pillow to smother her to death and basically has a a few days of kind of psychotic break happening, trying to figure out, you know, how to deal with what he's done, how to come to terms with what he's done after killing his wife. And he comes to the conclusion that he's going to take his own life, that he wants to kill himself in the last place where him and Mary were happy together. Silent Hill, the, f- the last place where they went together before Mary started showing signs of illness. So he puts Mary's body into the back seat of his car, not into the trunk like he's hiding her or, you know, hide- bringing a body with no respect Uh, Ito, Masahiro Ito, very specifically talks about this on Twitter a lot over the years, where he has a lot of care even in the afterlife for Mary. He didn't hate her. He didn't kill her out of, you know, spite or hate or anything like that. He loved her. And he's treating her body still with respect. He's putting her body in the back seat as though he's just going on vacation with his wife to the town of Silent Hill where they were last happy together. Except he plans on getting there and driving his car directly into the lake, taking his own life so that he and her can be together in death. He gets to the town. He has a psychotic break. He makes up the three-year delusion. He makes up the letter that we now see is not real. As his sort of false reality, as his false perception of why he's here and what he's done and the whole time his whole sort of journey through all of this has just been him his subconscious through the power of the town making him forcing him to come to terms with what he's done so now we start to piece these these things together 
the reason why Laura has these letters, uh, stealing them out of the nurse Rachel's locker, kind of the meaning behind it. We get a closer idea of the timeline that Mary was still alive just a little over a week ago. Laura just turned eight last week. So it, it hasn't been more than a week, you know, uh, since Mary was in the hospital writing these letters before being sent home, killed by James, and then everything else happening up to this point. Let's see, Laura drew a cat. A drawing done by Laura, a cat. Kind of similar to the way the animals are drawn in the alleyway where we see Laura after the Blue Creek Apartments exit. Um, which further kind of explains that that graffiti might be done by her. And again, shows that difference in reality where James sees that graffiti done by a child, most likely done by Laura, as being very old and worn, um, even though Laura probably just did it, you know, right before James got there. <clears throat> You get a, uh, a little bit of a memory from James about Mary by examining the piano. There's a piano here. I remember how much Mary liked to play the piano. She wasn't very good, but I still love to hear her play. That was so long ago, before we were even married. Why am I thinking of that now? So everything up to this point sort of forcing James to break through that delusion. But on top of that, he's also experiencing things like this to kind of remind him of good memories, pleasant memories as well. On top of everything horrible, there is some, some good and some light kind of mixed in there as part of coming to terms with it. Yes, he's going to have these bad memories and feelings, uh, you know, dealing with what he's done. But there's good things that are worth hanging on to, good memories that are worth having and not blocking out as well. So I like that there's still elements like that in the, the piano text to kind of convey that idea. And you can see Abstract Daddy is now just a regular enemy. And you might be wondering, you know, this was something so specific to Angela, why is it showing up here? But uh, as we will find out in a little bit, Angela is also here in the hotel. So we'll be having our, uh, our final encounter with her. <clears throat> um, you can examine the desk here, the front desk, and there's a letter, Mr. or a note, Mr. James Sunderland, the videotape you forgot here is being kept in the office on the first floor. So now you've got an idea of where your ultimate goal is. You're trying to get to that, that, uh, videotape. There's a key to room 312, the key to the room where Mary and I stayed. So, key to room number 312 in the hotel was lying behind the counter of the lobby reception desk. Nothing here that looks useful. Looks like the phone is broken. Nothing else useful back here, but... A lot of these little notes and things that are kind of uh, easy to miss at times. There's a bell here. Even if I ring it, I don't think anyone will come. Try it. Painting is hanging here. There's nothing unusual about it. Most unusual thing about all of this is this giant music box just sort of sitting in the very middle of the floor. There's a rectangular indentation. There's a plate in front of the indentation and something is engraved on it. Seat of the princess who awoke from death. Play the music box? Sure. It's 
Sounds beautiful. This doesn't sound quite right. Is the music box broken? Or maybe. So, we've got one music box. But we'll have to come back to this when we have all three. I can't leave this hotel just yet. Doesn't even specify, you know, that we're still looking for Mary. That should be, that should be assumed at this point. He doesn't need to further expand on his thoughts. Push the button, but nothing happens. So for now, the hotel is just sort of going through, narrowing down which doors, which wings you kind of have access to. Uh, what places are locked, where we'll eventually have a key to open something. And one of the things I like that they include about this sort of preliminary exploration, they're assuming the player is looking around through all of these places to see where you can go and what you can do, like it's part of the game. You've got to scour everything, right? And they assume that you're going to do this in a certain order, where you'll examine certain places that you can't get to yet, and they include some interesting little details for that. So if you try and go immediately to the third floor, where room 312 is, where James and Mary stayed together, you come up here and realize there's a gate in the way that's locked that you don't have the key for yet. And as you turn around to leave, you'll hear Mary's voice. James. Right there, very faintly. You can hear Mary call out, James. But it's only if you try and visit the third floor early before you have the key for this gate. So... Kind of your your inclination that you're getting close. You're almost you're almost done. You're getting there. Mary is the sound of her voice is like right there. Same text. There's a bell here. Even if I ring it, I don't think anyone will come. It's the cloakroom. Like a sign on it that says staff only, but it's unlocked. More supplies. All these little weird paintings and old portraits. Again, I like all the, the little details in the environments, even stuff you can't necessarily interact with. I can't hear anything from the receiver. Could the phone line possibly be cut? The suitcase is locked. So this is opened with the fish key. A key to open a thing to get another key. We are at that point of the survival horror game. Got the key to the hotel room 204. So now we can go into 204. A key to open a thing to get a key to open a thing to get a key. Tourist brochures are lined up here. Not interested in them right now. Some shotgun shells sitting in the library, you know. Nothing strange about that. How are we doing on ammo? Not much rifle, a lot of shotgun, a lot of handgun. More than enough. There's a book here. Doesn't look like it'll be of any particular use. If you are doing New Game Plus, uh, later after viewing the tape, right here on this shelf is where the Crimson Tome will uh, usually spawn. Um, there's also some optional audio that happens later, so we'll come back to this library then in order to hear that audio. 
There's a book open on top of the desk. Looks like a medical book. We get some more insight here. This is kind of similar to like the liquor bottles in Heaven's Night, where you examine something and James gives you some insight into his character. Uh, I've already read enough medical books. None of them ever did any good. So it's not much. It's very short, but it is still just something to give you some inclination to James's character. The idea, the same way with the liquor bottles, giving you the impression that he drank. He did that as an escape from pain and loneliness, but eventually overcame it in order to you know come here and look for Mary. So here he's looking at the medical book, and instead of just saying that it's something that he doesn't need right now, he's irritated by it. He doesn't even like that, you know, he he's got to see it because he's like i read enough of these books when mary was sick and none of them did anything to help so he's kind of like bitter about it and that comes through in in that bit of text the way he reacts Uh, hey, Nub, I know you're pro at this now, but when you first did lore runs, were you nervous? Did you have notes ready? Um, no, wasn't really nervous. Didn't really have notes ready. Like, I I make notes because before I even did lore runs on Twitch, I've been a fan of playing these games since 99. I've been researching them heavily since, like, 2002, 2003, um, when I started joining forums, reading interviews, and, like, looking into all the more detailed aspects of them, playing them a lot more often. And I kind of already did this. I would talk to friends and people through internet forums and swap ideas and theories and explain stuff. So it was never... It was never something like that I had to learn how to do specifically when I started doing it on Twitch. So I wasn't really nervous about it. I have notes and I make a lot of notes when it comes to keeping all this information together, but I very rarely actually use them when I stream. At this point, I just kind of pull everything I can from memory. Sometimes I'll pull up a note really quick just to remember a specific detail or uh, something that I don't always keep on the tip of my tongue, but... Yeah. I have notes, but they're more like study for outside of stream rather than having pulled up and reading off of during streams. And yeah, I've just been doing this all for so long. Almost everything I talk about and go through and do is just committed to memory. Just from literally playing the games thousands of times. None of these other hotel rooms let you investigate. You can see that one locked one at the end of the hallway, but you don't wind up getting in there until much later. And we get the employee elevator key. Photos are scattered all over the bed. What's this? Part of the photo has been colored over with a marker. So you need a four letter word for this particular puzzle and it's a randomly generated, you know, solution every time you play the game, but it's a list of, I think it's 26, 26 four letter words. Uh, four is not one of them, woo, <laughs> but hello. Um, so when we used to speedrun this back in the day, before RNG manipulation and stuff, I started speedrunning this in 2015. Um, at that time, the general strategy was to brute force this particular puzzle by just cycling through all the possible answers in as few dial turns as possible. So 
you would do that by starting with mama. So you'd set everything to mama, which is one of the possible four letter combinations. Sometimes if you're very lucky back in back then when it was just up to randomness and going for it and brute forcing, sometimes mama would be the first thing and you just get it first try and then briefcase opens and you move on. From here, you would click this four times and this four times and it gives you dam. So D-A-M-N. Uh, from here, you can click this to go to R and this down to go to K for dark. And you just cycle through every possible word. So mama, damn, dark, dose, uh, lose, love, lock, luck, uh, kill, hell, help, down, town, uh, time, there it is. So you just go through, cycle through until you get it. That's the, the classic 2015 speed strat. You just cycle through everything. Um, but yeah. And the normal way to solve that, if you go downstairs from the restaurant where we met Laura, um, if you go downstairs from there, you can go into an elevator and find a bottle of paint thinner. You use the paint thinner on the photo on the bed to remove this uh, marker, and it shows you the correct answer for the briefcase. But it's a fun way to do it, where you can just cycle through, you can just brute force, try everything, Do you have a lore run of a game on your bucket list? What does that mean? I Everything that I care enough about the lore to research it and put effort into, I've already done. Like, there's a lot of other games and stuff out there that I love, but nothing where I obsess about it the way I do with Silent Hill. And I've already done lore playthroughs of every single Silent Hill thing that exists. And have been doing that for the last, like, over eight years. So I don't, I don't understand the question if you mean something else. Ouch. Locked. Will I do all the Silent Hill story playthroughs after two? I will. I've already done the entire series over the past several years. So if you want to see any of the times that I've done this before for any of the other games in the series, you can type exclamation point YT for a link to my YouTube channel. Or exclamation point VOD for a link to all my archive VODs here on Twitch. Um, but yeah, I I do I go through all the games in the series every few months and do these uh, sort of in-depth playthroughs. And I've been doing that for over eight years. So we've covered everything before. I just still do it because people still like me doing it. And a thinner. We'll watch them live, but I missed one. So Silent Hill 1 was... The the recent playthrough of Silent Hill 1 was uh, plagued with tech issues, so I was not able to finish it. Um, my PC died, which I'm currently raising money to for a replacement PC. So Silent Hill 1 didn't get finished. You didn't miss much. And again, I've been doing playthroughs on this channel for years, so... You can watch one of my older Silent Hill 1 playthroughs if you like, before, uh, if you want to see what it's like or what I have to say about it before I come back around to it again. Oh, 
Are there any new games that you would like to get invested in the same way as Silent Hill? Um, there's not really. Nothing is stopping me. Like streaming is is my my full time job. So if there's something that I want any any games that I want to invest that much time and effort into, I 100% have the opportunity and means to do that. Um, Death Stranding is probably the closest where or Metal Gear Solid where I've spent some time learning a lot about those games and uh, yeah but that's the thing is I, I like them I enjoy them but I have the opportunity to research them as much as Silent Hill, and I choose to spend my time in other ways. So it obviously doesn't interest me as much. I'm not as invested. Because with Silent Hill, I still spend time. I Even after all these years, even after everything I've learned, especially now with a bunch of new games coming out. Um, yeah, like, I still spend a lot of time Hey, time, four-letter word, uh, on Silent Hill, whereas I don't really spend much time going back and researching Death Stranding or Metal Gear Solid nearly as much. So that's, that's kind of what I mean. I have the opportunity to spend my time however I wish, and there is nothing that I put as the same amount of time and effort into as Silent Hill. That's the, the ultimate answer there. All right, employee elevator room. There are memos hanging here, but nothing interesting written. Just kind of some general stuff in the environment. Empty box. This is the main attraction here. The elevator and the shelf of items. So I guess you could consider this a puzzle. You need to progress. You need to figure out what to do in order to progress. You step onto the elevator. Alarm starts going off. This permit shall be posted on the conveyance. Wait allowance one person. What's this? There's a notice above the, the buttons, weight allowance one person. So James weighs more than one person. There's, there's too much weight. And the whole idea is that you just need to put all of your items on this shelf. Looks like I could store my stuff here. So you're supposed to go through and put all of your items on the shelf. And I just want to show, for example, here, um, we have the photo in the letter of Mary that we started with, and I've already pointed out how the text is faded away from this letter, and we know that this letter is not real. Kid Pro Quo, thank you so much. You know what is real is $50 from Kid Pro Quo going towards the PC fund. Thank you so much, Kid Pro Quo. That is very generous of you. Thank you, thank you. Really appreciate it, dude. Um... Thank you so much. But going back to this, um, everything that you place, let's say, for example, Laura's letter, which is just like two pieces of paper. Put everything away. Except for these two pieces of paper, Laura's letter. And it doesn't work. We're still too heavy. We're still overweight. So let's take everything back. This time, we're going to put everything on the shelf except for the photo of Mary and the letter from Mary that we know is not real. So all we have left is the photo of Mary, the letter from Mary. Elevator does not trigger. 
even if it's a single piece of paper, the elevator typically goes off. But if you have these things, this photo of Mary and the letter from Mary, and again, you examine this, it's just blank stationary now, slowly turning into nothing in your inventory during the last part of the game. The game doesn't trigger. So now there's, there's an interesting little thought experiment that I, I always want to bring up here. Is this an intentional detail where Team Silent said, this photo of Mary is too important to James and this letter from Mary is not real. So when it comes to this elevator that forces you to put everything away, these two things should be allowed to remain on you for lore and story reasons. These should not affect the elevator sensor going off. Was this an intentional decision or is this a convenient little quirk of how items are programmed in this game? Because when you very first start Silent Hill 2, all throughout this game, you're picking things up. You're picking up health drinks. You're picking up weapons. You're picking up everything except for two items. Two items in this game you never, ever pick up. The photo of Mary and the letter from Mary. They start in your inventory. So there might be some sort of code for specifically items that are picked up that need to be put away in order to not trigger this elevator. In which case these, because they were never picked up, it's just a convenient little detail of their code that you can get onto the elevator with them. So is it a game? Is it a quirk of the game mechanics? Is it an intentional story lore thing? I don't know. There's never been an official statement made by the devs or, or anything about it one way or the other, but it's interesting. And that's what's important. It's an interesting aspect of the game. It, it could potentially, you know, mean something storyline wise, or it could just be, uh, an interesting little quirk, but it says a lot that people still, you know, play these games after all this time and still theorize over these kind of things. Cause it's more than just my crazy ass over here doing that on Twitch. There's tons of people in the silent Hill community who do this exact same thing. And, you know, think about it even far deeper and no more bits of info and trivia than even I do. So the fact that people still do that after all these years for these games, I think says a lot about these kind of details. Our desire to, to know more about these games, you know? To learn more, to figure more things out. So we make it down the elevator. We have none of our things with us except for the photo of Mary and the letter that's not real. We have an updated map, the hotel map for employees. So it uh, marks and labels a lot of these rooms uh, that are back in staff only areas. Again, mostly closed off areas. I always want to go through and kind of check. You got a nice big bright red light kind of pointing you where to go here. And here is our second music box, the Snow White music box. Strangely, you can examine a lot of the stuff in this little storage room. There's like a lot of flavor text here. There are potatoes and onions here. They smell slightly rotten. There are apples and pumpkins here. And we did just pick up the Snow White music box. So there's a little bit of significance to apples and pumpkins being a thing right next to where we find it. Uh, pumpkins being, you know, magically transformed into um, Cinderella's carriage. So Snow White, the apple, the poison apple. Um, so we're finding things that are significant to some of these music boxes and their uh, respective fairy tales and stories that they come from. Cans of fruit are, are lined up. The expiration dates are probably long gone. Tea bags and cookies here. They're all past their expiration dates. G 
juice cans are lined up here. There's no reason to carry these with me. We literally used juice cans to solve a puzzle in the apartments. But for some reason now, James is like, no, nah, I'm not carrying this juice around in my pockets. Soup cans are lined up here. I guess they're still okay, but I'm not hungry. There's nothing here, but the whole thing smells vaguely moldy. Like I said, kind of a small room and surprisingly a lot of text. A lot of things that you can examine. Here's our office where we're going to get our videotape. It's a VHS copy of the Silent Hill movie. Someone recorded it on their VCR. Got the videotape. And there's a can opener beneath the videotape. Got a can opener. There's nothing here. Looks useful. Door don't open. Nothing useful written in the documents on top of the desk. Nothing else useful here, but... The videotape that James forgot at the hotel three years ago. Silent Hill is written on the label in my handwriting. This is definitely the videotape I recorded back then. Yeah, you also said this was definitely Mary's name in her own handwriting. And now... I don't think you are allowed to say that you're definite about anything, James. You are unsure at best. There's a schedule book here that dates from one year ago. So again, we're still seeing delusion from James's part, like things that are from a year ago or that the place looks like it used to look three years ago. He's still not seeing it the way that it actually is. Um, there is some text here, but you have to come back to this area after you've got your flashlight. So we can't examine this heater, but there's uh, theories that this heater is responsible for the fire damage to the hotel that we see uh, depicted later, depicted in the Burning Man painting that we saw in the prison earlier. So, once we get the flashlight and we can come back down here, we'll be able to examine that heater a bit more closely. Can't examine where the boxes are blocking where to go. One of the few areas in the game where you don't have your radio, and we also don't have any weapons. But there's still enemies that we have to deal with. Bar key. Some more supplies. So we're going to be able to open up that bar that was on the uh, lower floor near the elevator where we picked up the paint thinner. Empty wine bottles. And once we open up the bar, that'll be our way to backtrack to these areas. Uh, with everything that we had to leave behind to use the elevator. The refrigerator door seems broken. Can't get it open. There's a can with no label on it. The overlook in the Shining book also exploded from the boiler. True. And there is definitely inspiration for the Lakeview Hotel. Um being inspired on the Overlook, you know, inspired by the Overlook Hotel. But, uh... 
they've already done the boiler explosion gimmick in Silent Hill 1. So I think maybe they didn't want to repeat that. But we, like I said, we'll get some unique text when we examine that heater here in a moment. It's kind of weird, but we'll get there. We'll, we'll get there in a moment. Let's open up this can. Can with no label filled to the brim with the freshest light bulbs you've ever seen. There's light bulbs in the can. Got me a nice canned light bulb. I love this sort of just, this is just weird abstract shit. This is where like things are weird for the sake of being weird. And it's very kind of Lynchian like, sure. Light bulb in a can. Why not? Why not? Love all the different little alcohol labels and things. Put some details in there. Not just, you know, the same generic bottle copied and pasted. There's a jukebox here. It doesn't play, so it must be broken. I tried to use the bar key, but it's too dark to find the keyhole. See, we don't have our flashlight on us. And even though this, like, bar is fully lit, and this jukebox is, like, on and fully lit, and we can very clearly see this door, for some reason it's still too dark to find the keyhole and use the bar key to open it. That's why we need the lightness, the light that only a fresh light bulb can provide. The, the freshness of the light bulb that you only get from canned light bulbs. See, look, look how much it's like the, the fucking sun just came up here in the bar. We can see everything now. It's so much brighter. Now we can use the bar key. Ow. And immediately get punched in the mouth. So, we've now got music boxes. We can take everything back from the shelves. So we've got all three music boxes. We can solve the music box puzzle. We still have our 312 key. We have our videotape. But first, I want to go back to the area with the heater now that we've got our flashlight. got to go through like so much extra effort to even backtrack and do all this with your with your light so uh, a lot of people probably never did this in their playthrough even people who've played it a lot All the way back here with the flashlight just so that we can look at this heater and now that we've got a flashlight and we can examine things closer there's a heater here on the back in small letters it says I'm Johnny one hot guy and that's it that's what all the backtracking is for this is like the only thing in this whole area that gives you different text if you examine it again with the flashlight so, for some reason, they made this heater significant. On the back, in small letters, it says, I'm Johnny, one hot guy. And that's what led a lot of fans to speculating that this heater, at some point, would have been the cause of the fire that uh, damaged much of the hotel. Simply because 
it's there. Why else have that writing? Why else make it something that you can examine like that? And not anything else. Let's go use those music boxes. Let's solve the music box puzzle. Rectangular indentation. There's a plate in front of it. Seat of the princess who awoke from death. So these are all, you know, corresponding to different fairy tales, different stories. The princess that awoke from death would have been Snow White. She was poisoned with the apple, woken from her sleep by a kiss from Prince... Was that Prince Charming? Prince... Adam? <laughs> He-Man? I put down the Snow White music box. This doesn't sound quite right. Is the music box broken? Or maybe... We just need to put in the other ones. There's a rectangular indentation and a plate in front. Seat of the princess who fled at midnight. So f the fled at midnight, a reference to Cinderella, where the magic of the carriage and everything else, her gown, uh, the magic will wear off at midnight. So she is the princess who fled at midnight. Cinderella. In here... More of the song is coming together, but it still doesn't sound right. Still does not sound right. Lastly, we have the Little Mermaid music box. Music box with a figure from the fairy tale, The Little Mermaid, attached. And this is the seat of the princess who spoke no words. That is the Little Mermaid, who trades her voice for legs. And we complete the music box puzzle. stairway key key to door from stairway to third floor hall was inside the big music box in the lobby Got to get a little music box dance in. No Dagoth wave this time. Uh, we've already got the key to room 312. So now we can get to the third floor and we can get to room 312. No dancing. We did dance. Use the hotel stairway key. We literally just danced, Technokami. What's going on? Mom comes in and thinks I'm on a break when I'm clearly playing the game actively live. Technokami's saying no dancing right after I very clearly danced. What's going on? Are we perceiving reality differently? Is this a different playthrough to you guys than what I'm currently doing and seeing? Because I'm confused.
Well, we're here. We're in room 312. The hotel room where James and Mary spent their time while they were on vacation here in Silent Hill. The last place where they were happy got to do anything together before Mary's illness took hold. And it's finally time. There's a television here. Even when it's plugged in, all I get is snow. There's a VCR here. It looks like I'll still be able to use it. So this is where James finally comes to terms with what he's done. He has to face it directly. Um, the, the memories of what he's done. Obviously, the tape is a combination of things that James did film when he was holding a video camera and filming Mary talking. But then we see scenes of James killing Mary, which obviously weren't filmed. They're just James's memories of the event, you know, being forced to replay to him. Are you taping again? Come on. <sighs> I don't know why, but I just love it here. It's so peaceful. You know what I heard? This whole area used to be a sacred place. I think I can see why. <sighs> it's too bad we have to leave. Please promise you'll take me again, James. <laughs> Because she was sick? No. I killed her.
always waiting for you. Why? Why? I'm sorry. The Mary you know isn't here. Sorry. Always make sure to stay just a little bit longer there so you get all of that dialogue before just immediately leaving the room. How many how many times she calls out to him. I don't need the VCR anymore. There's nothing to see. Even the text when you examine things has become a lot more stoic. Like the full brunt of James's reality, like he's he's breaking out of that delusion now. He's come to terms with it. He knows what he's done. He's killed Mary. And now he has to deal with it. The same way that he was originally going to deal with it by taking his own life once he got to Silent Hill. But now he's got a chance to sort of rethink it. And the game's not quite over yet. There's still... A significant little chunk of things to do, but we're very close to the end now. And you can see the reality of the hotel has come through. It's no longer just the way James remembered it three years ago. It is burned and molded and decayed, dripping with water, where it seems like it's been flooded. Yeah, the soundtrack here with during that whole cutscene, all the audio and everything with Mary, um, which, by the way, that was not like edited down. It's not like there's a, an early version of Silent Hill 2 that has it included or anything like that. But in the game files, there was originally a, a different audio that was going to be used for when James smothers Mary, where you can actually hear mary struggling and fighting back um and sort of like her final panicked breaths it's a lot more intense you can look it up on youtube it's actually on uh, fungo's channel a lot of you are familiar with fungo from twin perfect <clears throat> if you ever want to pull that up and and watch the unedited version of it i'm not going to pull it up here just we've done it in previous playthroughs but if you want to see that or hear what that original audio was. It's out there if you want to see it or hear it. But yeah, most likely Team Silent decided that that was uh, a little too intense. So instead we get the more silent variation of that scene happening. Um some audio here. So this was the optional audio I mentioned earlier. If you come back here after watching the tape, you have this uh, tape recorder and headphones that you can listen to, and you get um, an idea of where the three-year 
timeline of James's delusion came from. Uh, you hear James talking about Mary's condition with one of her doctors. Uh, also, as a little bit of trivia, the voice for this doctor is uh, a man by the name of Dennis Fault, who also is the voice actor for Walter Sullivan in Silent Hill 4. So this is actually the first time we hear Walter Sullivan's voice actor in the Silent Hill series is the voice of this doctor. Mary's going to die? You, you must be joking. You must be joking. I'm very sorry. But you're a doctor. It's your job to heal people. How can you just let her die? Please, calm down. As her doctor, I promise I'll do what I can. But there's still no effective treatment for her condition. How long does she have? I'm afraid I'm not sure. Three years at most. Perhaps six months. Three years at it's most. It's impossible to say with certainty. So that's where James kind of latched on to that three-year timeline, even though it turned out to be false. Can't hear anything anymore. But yeah, that's kind of interesting hearing Walter Sullivan's voice. A very similar tone, because it's the same actor. They sort of do like this door puzzle here, this hallway, uh, very reminiscent of the hospital hallway in uh, Silent Hill 4, where you've just got this long hallway with doors on either side, and uh, you kind of have to figure out which ones you can go through that don't just loop you around to the same hallway. Again, this audio, this droning audio in the background, these dissonant tones, just super unsettling, the uh, water dripping sounds, everything. Can't open it. Not jammed, not locked. We just, we're not going that way. We can't do it. Look at these water effects, baby. Two thousand one at its finest. And it's not much different from the original version to the enhanced edition. It's essentially the same effect, same texture. Exactly, some next gen water there. And the way the whole texture kind of ripples when you move through it. Hey, for 2001, early PS2 days, that was uh, that was pretty impressive. Jukebox, no use for that right now. So many health drinks. This game really saw how often, like, they had to build in a failsafe in Silent Hill 1 in case you show up to the final boss unprepared. So they really went out of their way with Silent Hill 2 to, like, on your final path here to the end of the game, here's fucking all these supplies. Tons of ammo, tons of healing. <clears throat> Oh, 
there he is. There's a lying figure running around this part. Just under the water. So, there he is. How are you still alive? So now we've got our final scene with Angela. And yeah, this is an intense scene. It's another example of, I think, our reality, the way James is perceiving reality, the way Angela's perceiving reality sort of clash, similar to the way James and Eddie had their realities kind of mixing and clashing just before the final confrontation with Eddie. So now with Angela... She sees fire, and we as the player are able to see a little bit of what Angela sees, but James does not react to it as though he sees the fire. He comments on the heat, but not like, holy shit, everything is burning down. Um, so again, this is one of those examples of how reality is de being perceived by different characters in this, at the same time, and how it's being shown to the player. Because this is one of the few times where the player is seeing something other than what James sees. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to talk about the scene. We'll watch it and then talk about it. But amazing performance by both Guy Sihi and um, Donna Burke for this scene right here. you for saving me but I wish you hadn't even mama said it I deserved what happened no Angela that's wrong no don't pity me I'm not worth it Maybe you think you can save me. Will you love me? Take care of me? Heal all my pain? Hmm. <laughs> That's what I thought. James, give me back that knife. No, I, I won't. Saving it for yourself? Me? N no, I'd never kill myself. It's hot as hell in here. You see it too. For me, it's always like this.
and that is the last we see of Angela. One of the most tragic characters in all of Silent Hill, in all of the series. One of the best scenes in this game. I think one of the best performances. Great piece of music, great cinematography. Going back and forth between James's perspective, literally a first person view at one point, where Angela is sort of like right in your face, sort of talking to you during the like, you know, are you gonna love me, heal me, uh, take away all my pain, all that, where you're not even seeing James, you're seeing directly from James's perspective with Angela just sort of like right in your face. Um, Again, we get the character reactions sort of showing the disparity, the difference between how they're perceiving reality. Angela always sees the fire the same way that James sees fog and rust and decay. Angela sees flames, you know, she sees this. Or some variation of this. We don't even know if this is exactly what she perceives, but there's at least some element to it is this fire. And specifically, James doesn't react to it as though it's there. He just reacts to the heat. Um, there's the bodies. So otherwise, normal staircase other than the fire and the bodies. So the two big, like, framed almost uh, bodies on either side appear to be, like, the top... Uh, the topmost area of it being like somebody's head then where it comes in closer where their neck would be bulges out again where their stomach their chest their torso would be and then down to where their legs are um, so it looks like presumably two bodies and Angela's dialogue when James first walks in here and she says mama she confuses James for her mother she's perceiving James as her mother for a moment in her delusion and she says now you know you're the only one uh, that's left maybe now I can rest insinuating that she's already dealt with or done something with her father and brother uh, we saw what happened with Thomas Orozco James fought him and Angela finished him off with the TV at some point something must have also happened with her brother um, who we know was most likely also physically and sexually abusive towards her. So we have these two bodies framing, you know, either side of the burning staircase where Angela is talking about her mama being the only one left, presumably that Angela has killed her whole family at this point. We don't know if she actually did that. Some people speculate that she killed her whole family and set her house on fire and that this is her like reliving that. Um, but we'd never get any kind of information to confirm that one way or the other. We on, The only thing we really know for sure is that newspaper article. It's most likely sh true and real that she stabbed her father to death. We don't know for sure about her brother and mother. But she's looking for her mama. She killed possibly manifestations of her father and brother here and her real father uh, but yeah just really excellent scene altogether. so much to convey like so much information conveyed from the dialogue and from the scene the visuals itself um, also the just as another quick note and then we'll move on from this the performances in this game, it is almost always the actors in person uh, acting together. Like, whenever you see Eddie and James interacting in a cutscene together, it usually meant that Guy Seahee and Dave Shoffley, both of the voice actors, were there in mocap suits on a set acting with each other, not just by themselves. Um, this scene on the stairway is one of the only scenes in the entire game where the actors were not there in person when they did the mocap and, and recording for it. So Donna Burke did her part, 
on her own and then Guy Sihi did his part on his own and this came out as one of the better scenes in the entire game even though it's like one of only two scenes I think where the actors weren't there in person so interesting how how good a lot of things can come together even when they don't have their like preferred method of recording Would you say where the blood is coming from on the body signifies something? I mean, possibly. There's always a chance that anything could be significant, but um, we can't even go back and check exactly where the blood is now, because we that whole stairwell just like doesn't exist anymore. Everything just ceases to exist once you go back through that door. We're just back into the hotel. You can see here a lot of the fire damage. Still uh, a lot of the water damage as well. You can see fire department, do not cross. Kind of gives the impression that it was burning and then flooded in order to put out the fire. So we're sort of seeing it in that state where it's just burned out and flooded and then abandoned for years. <clears throat> More mandarins. More of these silly little guys. Let's see if we can get a good shot of their dropping animation. Nope, oh, there he goes. You can definitely tell you're kind of at a at a significant turning point here. James has seen the VHS tape. He's remembered that he's responsible for Mary's death. He's come this far. He's seeing the hotel the way that, you know, it should be his whole idea of, you know, reality has has changed and he's breaking out of this delusion. We see the save point, this the nine red squares, which Ito uh, on Twitter said each of these nine red squares represents a different manifestation. So all of the creatures and everything that James has been encountering, all, everything manifested is represented by, you know, each one of these nine squares. So now he's at the end of it where he's almost done dealing with these manifestations. He's done dealing with delusion and essentially just facing the truth. There was imagery earlier of two pyramid heads next to a hanging body in the prison. Mention of prisoners being skewered 
as part of their death penalty? So now all of that comes to fruition here. James once again being forced to remember Mary's death violently right in front of him. I was weak. That's why I needed you. I needed someone to punish me for my sins. But that's all over now. I know the truth. Now it's time to end this. So now we've got to deal with two spear-wielding pyramid heads. There's now another pyramid head, another executioner, another representation of punishment. And uh, a lot of people theorize that this is because James has killed someone else. Initially, there has only been this one pyramid head, this one sort of representation of guilt because he'd only killed one person, Mary. Now he's also killed Eddie. So... That's what some people theorize, is uh, why we're seeing this second executioner, even though it is kind of hinted at and foreshadowed as far back as the prison, where we see the two pyramid heads holding spears um, next to the body hung in the noose uh, on where we put the three tablets. I don't know what this other pyramid head's doing. Usually he walks right up next to this one. You can potentially get a good pattern here with the great knife if you swing back and forth and rapidly switch targets between uh, the left and right pyramid head, which is all I was doing there, and the fight is done. It only really works on normal difficulty, but uh, good consistent strategy for uh, dealing with this otherwise pretty difficult fight. Um, interesting note about this room, little piece of trivia. So if you look at the floor, this rug has some very faint circular symbols on either side. That is the uh, seal of Metatron from Silent Hill 1. It's the only time we see the seal of Metatron in Silent Hill 2. And people actually brought this up to Ito on Twitter uh, a couple of years ago. And Ito mentioned that this particular texture was not... It was like a placeholder. Like, this was not supposed to be in the final game. They didn't want to include any symbols or anything that were directly from the first game in the second one. They wanted this to kind of be its own separate experience and, you know, not have any ties to the... Not super strong ties to the first game. So, it was actually a mistake that the Seal of Metatron is visible here. This was just a texture that never got updated now it's part of the game forever. Pyramid Head won't move anymore. Looks like he's holding something. So each Pyramid Head gives us a different egg. Because of course we would get something strange like an egg. A Scarlet Egg and a Rust Colored Egg. Following that same theory of each of these Pyramid Heads representing a different guilt for a different murder. The murder of Mary and the murder of Eddie. A lot of people believe that the rust-colored egg represents Mary with her illness, her decay, uh, and the entire rust theme sort of being based behind that. And the scarlet egg being that Eddie was a much more recent victim who was not ill, at least as far as we can tell. Not physically. And each of these doors is locked with a round indentation, exactly where we're meant to use the eggs. It does not matter and does not affect anything which egg you use in which door. 
just that you use them both. I love this texture. It's just weird. It looks kind of like a face. And it's just creepy. It's a lot of things like that in the game that it doesn't need any deeper meaning than that. It's just weird looking and creepy. Um, here is some exceptionally good dialogue, some great delivery from uh, Monica Horrigan as Mary. Mary? What do you want, James? I, uh, I brought you some flowers. Flowers? I don't want any damn flowers. Just go home already. Mary, what are you saying? Look, I'm disgusting. I don't deserve flowers. Between the disease and the drugs, I look like a monster. Well, what are you looking at? Get the hell out of here! Leave me alone already! No use to anyone. I'll be dead soon anyway. Maybe today. Maybe tomorrow. It'd be easier if they'd just kill me. But I guess the hospital's making a nice profit off me. They want to keep me alive. Are you still here? I told you to go! Are you deaf? Don't come back! James! Wait! Please don't go! Stay with me! Don't leave me alone! I didn't mean what I said. Please, James. Tell me I'll be okay. Tell me I'm not going to die. Help me. Yeah, really great performance. Going back and forth between, like, being angry and just resentful. And, I mean, you're trying... You imagine, as an actress, you're trying to portray this character that is having to come to terms with their own mortality. You're you're going to die from this illness. You're stuck in a bed. You feel horrible. And, like, you're trying to go back and forth. You're trying to blame it on somebody, blame it on something, you know, take your anger out, but still not want to be alone, you know, when you die. The same that... Most people would probably struggle with all of these kind of feelings when you're faced with your own mortality being so close like that. And I think it's just wonderfully, you know, very, very tragically, but wonderfully portrayed. Excellent performance, like I said. Here's one of the few times in the game where we get, like, a, uh, a rain effect. As we make our way up. To the final boss. Final area. The conclusion of Silent Hill 2. Because there's only one thing that's left to confront. We know what James did. We know everything else. But... Now, he's gotten past his guilt. Killing the two pyramid heads, or rather them killing themselves, represents James moving past that guilt. Now it's just, how does he come to terms with it? How does he go on knowing the truth? And you can get a slight idea of which ending you're about to get at this point here. If you see Mary laying in the bed, you're going to be getting the Maria ending. But if it's Maria standing over by the window, it's going to be either the leave or in water ending. So we'll find out in a moment which ending we got. Mary? When will you ever stop making that mistake? Mary is dead. 
You killed her. Maria, it's you. But I don't need you anymore. What? You must be joking. But I can be yours. I'll be here for you forever. And I'll never yell at you or make you feel bad. That's what you wanted. I'm different than Mary. How can you throw me away? I understand now. It's time to end this nightmare. No, I won't let you. You deserve to die too, James. And now we see her true form. Again, just like earlier with the flesh lips and the pyramid head victims where we picked up the great knife. She's uh, depicted in a cage representing Mary's bed frame that she felt that she was a prisoner of. The uh, tentacle itself, I think, supposed to represent being hooked up to, like, the, the machinery, the things that kept her alive, her IV, uh, any other medical devices that she's, like, a part of, you know, that keeps her alive the way that she put it, you know, the hospital making profit of off of her by kind of keeping her alive. You'll notice that she's having a hard time hitting me. If you manage to stand in this spot right here, directly in front of the bed, she's uh, most of the time not able to reach you. So you can just kind of sit and attack from here. We haven't seen her use it, but she has an attack with mods. We're going to move away and give her a fighting chance. Because I want to show off the moth attack. Because it is lore significant. The same way that we saw them earlier. And they sort of represent the idea of reincarnation or rebirth. And we're seeing a new form of Mary yet again. Different from Maria, but definitely different from Mary. So we're once again seeing that re, you know, rebirth imagery and uh, symbolism in those mods. Show some of her attacks on James. So she can strike like that with the tentacle. She can also grab. She tried to do it there. I don't know why it didn't hit. I don't know why she can't grab. There it is. Yeah, so she can grab and strangle James. Very much the way James, you know, smothered the life out of Mary. She can have her revenge. Now it's time to end this, Mary. hit her with like every weapon at least once oh other attack vertical attack bop oh we finished it with the bite
gave her the bonk. You do have to sit here and sort of watch her creepily writhe and open her mouth and just keep saying James over and over until we bonk her with a piece of wood with some nails in it. Goodbye forever. Enjoy the ending. That's Silent Hill 2. I'll be back after the credits to say goodnight. Mary? <coughs> James. Forgive me. I told you that I wanted to die, James. I wanted the pain to end. That's why I did it, honey. I just couldn't watch you suffer. No. That's not true. You also said you didn't want to die. The truth is, I hated you. I wanted you out of the way. I wanted my life back. James. If that were true, then why do you look so sad? Mary? James. Please. Please do something for me. Go on with your life. In my restless dreams, I see that town. Silent Hill. You promised you'd take me there again someday, but you never did. Well, I'm alone there now, in our special place, waiting for you. waiting for you to come to see me. But you never do. And so I wait, wrapped in my cocoon of pain and loneliness. I know I've done a terrible thing to you, something you'll never forgive me for. I wish I could change that. But I can't. I feel so pathetic and ugly laying here, waiting for you. Every day I stare up at the cracks in the ceiling, and all I can think about is how unfair it all is. The doctor came today. He told me I could go home for a short stay. It's not that I'm getting better. It's just that this may be my last chance. I think you know what I mean. Even so, I'm glad to be coming home. I've missed you terribly. But I'm afraid, James. I'm afraid you don't really want me to come home. Whenever you come see me, I can tell how hard it is on you. I don't know if you hate me or pity me, or maybe I just disgust you. I'm sorry about that. When I first learned that I was going to die, I just 
didn't want to accept it. I was so angry all the time, and I struck out at everyone I loved most. Especially you, James. That's why I understand if you do hate me. But I want you to know this, James. I'll always love you. Even though our life together had to end like this, I still wouldn't trade it for the world. We had some wonderful years together. <laughs> well, this letter has gone on too long, so I'll say goodbye. I told the nurse to give this to you after I'm gone. That means that as you read this, I'm already dead. I can't tell you to remember me. But I can't bear for you to forget me. These last few years since I became ill, I am so sorry for what I did to you, did to us. You've given me so much and I haven't been able to return a single thing. That's why I want you to live for yourself now. Do what's best for you, James. James, you made me happy. Uh, by the way, Laura, when we get to my car, just don't look in the back seat.
And that is Silent Hill 2.